Good afternoon. Welcome to Louisiana School's 37th Exploration Day, but it's our very first virtual Exploration Day. And on behalf of the faculty and staff, and the current student body, and the alumni of the Louisiana School for Math, Science, and the Arts, I welcome you to one of the best experiences that you are about to be able to say I'm a part of. Louisiana School has rich in tradition, but what it always has been as the school for Louisiana's best and brightest. So before you, about 5,000 students have come through these doors and have undertaken the most rigorous courses of study and had some of the best experiences that have allowed them to go out in the world and succeed, whether it was in college, graduate school, or even in their first jobs. So as you move through today's events, ask lots of questions. And for moms and dads who are here with us today, realize that this is a big decision for you to actually allow your students to come to us for either two or three years of the final years of high school. But trust me, it is worth it that they be able to see and experience what a Louisiana school education can do for them as they move on to the first parts of their life. So without further ado, let's swing our camera over to today's schedule of events. This is the schedule for those of you watching live with us on Sunday, November the 8th. The first hour and a quarter will be mostly informative sessions as we start with these presentations from two of our directors and then a quick 15 minute video with a few of our current students on hand to answer some of my most frequently asked questions. After that, we'll finish it all up from 2.15 until almost 5 o'clock with the really exciting stuff, which is our professors getting to do what they love and teaching the students. While we filmed all of these sessions in advance, the first showing of this video is being aired as a live broadcast. As such, you won't be able to fast forward but you can pause and rewind as needed. I recommend keeping up with the live stream as much as possible because whenever an informational segment is playing, the person or people who recorded that video will be available in the live chat section to answer any questions you might have at that time. You'll see that today's schedule is also available in the video's description below. So if you need to step away from your computer, you can always check to see what time you want to be back. After this video airs, it will remain on our YouTube channel, but we will also break it up into easier to navigate individual sections and create a new playlist here as well. With that taken care of, let's go ahead and get started with our presentations from our Director of Enrollment and Student Services, Ms. Emily Shoemate, and our Director of Academic Services, Dr. Christy Pope Key. Welcome both of them. Thank you, Dr. Horton, and thank you for serving as our MC for our Exploration Day. I'm Emily Shumate. I'm Director of Enrollment and Student Services for LSMSA. I've been with the school for over 20 years. As I was completing my master's degree in psychology at Northwestern State University, I learned about the Louisiana School, and I started initially working as a student life advisor in the residence hall, and then moved into the role of Director of Student Services. I've been doing that job since 2001, and I took on the admissions and enrollment program a few years ago as well. And so I look forward to talking with you today about the residential life program and also about a little bit what we do in the admissions office and the enrollment process. I'm going to begin by talking about our student services program. And that program can really be divided into a few specific areas. I like to talk about residential life, student wellness, community involvement, athletics and recreation, and also student activities. To begin with, we'll talk about our residential life program. And our residential life staff consists of the Assistant Director of Student Services, Ms. Jenny Schmidt, our two coordinators of residence life, Regina Brissett and Byron Cole, and then our student life advisors, resident assistants, the office staff, and some student life interns. The student life advisors are our full-time degreed live-in staff members. They're really the people that are there to provide supervision, support, guidance, and social activities for the students. They live on the hall with the students, and each of them has a group of about 40 to 60 students that they're responsible for working with. 
They are often that first line of contact for parents. They see the students pretty much every day. They have an idea about what's going on in their lives. They visit with them about their assignments. They have the same access to the grade book and, and the academic coursework that the students are completing that parents do. And so they're able to check in and see how that is going and visit with the students. They'll be the ones that may see them in the evening and see that something's going on, that they've had a bad day and follow up to see how things are, what they can do to help, and to connect the students with some other resources and other services on campus. So your child's student life advisor is going to be a very important connection for you when your student comes to LSMSA. The student life advisors work collaboratively with our resident assistants, and the resident assistants are undergraduate students, um, usually seniors or juniors in college, who provide some additional assistance for the student life advisors and some building coverage for us. In general, for our program of residential life at LSMSA, the focus is to help students develop independent living skills in a safe and nurturing environment. I talk a little bit um, about the experience as being one of guided independence because one of the things that you'll see when students come to LSMSA is we do expect for them to have more independence than they have previously at their home school. We expect for them to show more responsibility. So nobody's going to wake them up for class in the morning and nobody's going to be um, doing their laundry for them and some of the things that, that they're probably accustomed to you guys doing for them when they're at home with their parents. But the other side of that is we do recognize that they're still high school students. They're not yet college students. And so we need some safety nets in place. And so while we won't wake them up for classes in the morning, we will run some attendance rosters. And if we see that a student's missing classes and we don't know why, we're going to go track them down. And at that point, we'll probably wake them up and, and help them make it to, to some of their later in the day classes. It, initially, we're going to expect them to, to show some good study habits and, and to take the initiative to, to get into a good study cycle but if we see that they're starting to struggle with that we're going to swoop in and we're going to try to help out a little bit we're going to maybe put them on some additional study hours or an additional um, supervised study program so we want to give them a chance to explore their independence to show us that they're prepared for this um, experience and to, to show responsibility but we also are going to step in and help out if they struggle with those things in a way that you won't see when they do get to college and really are expected to handle all of those things on their own. In the interest of community um, wellness and student safety and for it to be a, a good living environment for all the students, we have a number of policies and procedures in place. I'll start with um, the fact that all of our students do have roommates generally and part of that has to do with space. We typically don't have um, the space for private rooms to be offered but additionally we think that learning to live with a roommate and learning how to compromise and how to share a space and how to work with other people is a really important part of the LSMSA experience and the process overall. We have a lot of rules and a lot of policies and um, as you get further along in the process and it becomes more of a reality that your student may be attending the school, we talk a little bit more in depth about the policies and students certainly become very familiar with the expectations. But I do like at this point to hit on just a few things that parents tend to be concerned about. One of those is our visitation policy. We do not allow um, male and female students to visit in one another's rooms and so um, they're able to visit in some of the common areas of the residence hall, lobbies, and social spaces that are supervised by staff, but they're not allowed to go onto one another's floors or to one another's rooms. We also have a very detailed sign-out process, whereas, whereby when students need to leave the residence hall, they, they have to let us know where they're going and how they're going to get there and what time they'll be back. And there are a lot of policies in place that dictate where they can go and when they can go and what level of parental permission they have to have in order to, to go to those places, um, specifically when students are going to ride in cars or if they're going to drive their own vehicles, they have to follow some school rules about when and where those those privileges can take place, but also they have to have parental permission in order to drive their vehicles or to ride with uh, other individuals other than their parents. 
We also have some specific times during the day that we require students to check in. We have a window between 2 and 7 p.m., which we call speed bump. That's a term that the students came up with, and we've just gone with it. And so between 2 and 7, every student has to check in at the residence hall. We have to see their faces. We have to know that everybody's present and accounted for. And that's an important time for us because since we operate on a college schedule, students can leave the building at different times and return at different times. And so between 2 and 7, we know will have seen everybody and made sure that everybody's present and accounted for. And then additionally, we have um, our curfew, and that varies based on weeknight or weekend curfew, and sometimes also by the grade the students are in. Seniors can earn some privileges for extended curfew. And at curfew time, we do a room check. And so at room check time, the students have to go to their own rooms and the student life advisors and the resident assistants will come by and check that every student is present. And again, that every student is, is safe and well. This is an important part of the day for us because again, we don't have homeroom. And so at room check is another time we know that we're gonna see everybody's face and the student life advisor will have a chance to check in with them, ask how their day was, notice if, if things don't seem to be going well, maybe there's conflict conflict in the room. Um, those are the times that we can, we can start to address and, and be aware of those sorts of issues. As I mentioned, we've got a lot of policies. We have a lengthy code of conduct. Um, I'm sure you can imagine that to, to keep 350 students safe and well on our campus, we have to do so. Um, so we'll talk more about that um, further along. And if you have more specific questions, I'll be happy to answer your questions about the, the policies and our expectations. Our new residence hall is scheduled to open in fall of 2021, and we are very excited about that. The residence hall does feature fully furnished student rooms, so each student will have a bed and a desk and storage for their clothing and desk chairs. And um, the way the building is set up, the students will live with four students in each suite, and so that's two students per room, and then those four students share a bathroom area. The residence hall also has a laundry room on every hall, a study room on every hall, a hall commons area, which involves a little kitchenette area for students to do some, some basic food preparation and also some areas for hall meetings and students to, to visit and, and have some of their social activities. There are also several um, common spaces for the students. So there's a demonstration kitchen, which um, will be a place for us to do programming that involves cooking and, and teaching how to, to do different types of food preparation, but also for students to bake cookies and, and do things that, that they can't do in the little kitchenette areas on their halls. There's a game room and a craft room, a multi-purpose social room that we'll use for different types of activities and programs. The building does have wireless internet throughout and also a staffed reception area, and that area will be staffed and supervised 24 seven when students are on site. Our student health and wellness program is the second area that I'd like to talk about. Our health and wellness staff consists of our full-time nurse and our nursing assistant, as well as two personal counselors. And both the nurse and the counselors are on call whenever students are in session. So student life staff members can reach out and, and get in touch with the nurse or with the counselor any time that they need to do so throughout the day and evening overnight as well. In terms of health services, our nurse is able to provide medication administration, and that includes prescription and over-the-counter medications as needed for students. She can also offer illness assessment and make a determination if a student may need to go see a local physician. If she thinks the student does need to see a doctor, she'll work with parents and be in consultation with parents to talk about that and make those decisions. But if everybody's in agreement, she can schedule an appointment with a doctor in town and um, she or her nursing assistant or one of the student life staff members will take the students to the appointment. And then following the appointment, we can go to pharmacies, pick up prescriptions as needed. Um, and in addition to that, she can obviously provide first aid and emergency response as needed. And she trains the residential life staff to be able to administer medications, do illness assessment, do first aid, do CPR, so that they're able to provide necessary services to the students after hours as well. And then for our students, she provides health and wellness education. We tend to do some monthly series um, on different wellness topics that we think it's important for the students to learn about. 
Our personal counseling services are aimed towards providing brief and solution-focused counseling. Our counselors can meet with students for any number of issues. Certainly we see homesickness and adjustment issues. We see a lot of students that struggle with stress management and time management. Um, we find that once they're living in situations with roommates and sharing a space, some of our students need a little help with some assertiveness training and how to handle those conflicts that may arise. A number of our students may experience grief and loss during their time at LSMSA. And they also work with students on other emotional concerns, depression and anxiety and, and other things that, that are often a part of the teenage experience. We do look to, to try to handle those sorts of issues in a um, pretty short term setting. Um, so our counselors will generally try to meet with students for, for maybe 10 to 14 sessions max. And if a student might need ongoing counseling for a lengthier time period than that, they can make referrals to outside counselors. We have a number of counselors in the Natchitoches area and our staff can provide transportation to those appointments as needed. Our counselors also offer crisis intervention as necessary. The coordination of 504 accommodations for students who have accommodations in place. And again, they also provide some health and wellness education to our students. And so this photo shows one of our uh, Wellness on Wednesday seminars where the counselors and the nurse are, are all there um, providing some information as students are going to lunch in the Center for Performance and Technology. The next area I want to talk about is our athletics and recreation program. Athletics and recreation is headed up by Coach Dale Klingerman, and he serves as the coach for all of our team sports here at LSMSA. LSMSA doesn't participate in the Louisiana High School Athletic Association. Instead, we participate in some private school and some Christian school leagues, and that gives our students a great opportunity to compete, but also the ability for us to prioritize their academics, which has to come first for our students. One of the things I love most about sports at LSMSA is that any student who wants to participate on one of our teams is able to do so. It doesn't matter if they have a lot of ability, it doesn't matter if they've ever played the sport before. If they're willing to come out and give it a shot and work hard, we're thrilled to have them on the team and that's a really great opportunity for students. And I know a number of students who may not have had that opportunity at their home school, say participating in athletics at LSMSA has been a really meaningful part of their experience. What sports we offer, offer often depends upon the student interest that year, but in general, we offer girls and boys basketball, girls and co-rec volleyball, flag football, ultimate frisbee, and co-rec soccer. Students who want to participate in other sports or students who want to participate at a different level, be involved in Louisiana High School Athletic Association sports, can often do so by trying out for the teams at St. Mary's School or at Natchitoches Central High School. Both of those are local schools in town that will allow our students to play with them if they make the team. And so students who are very serious athletes or who would like some more information about that can get some from Coach Dale. He's happy to work with you guys and he serves as a liaison with the coaches at those other schools to make sure we can get those opportunities in place for our students. When he's not busy coaching his teams, Dale tries to coordinate some other recreational opportunities for students at our school. We tend to do some pickup games and some open gym time, and we also try to make sure that we schedule events during final exams week that can serve as stress relievers for our students. And so students who don't want to play at the team level can still be involved in the program, and we encourage everybody to do so. We also love to talk about SLAMPT. SLAMPT um, is an event that we hold each spring where students from sister schools, schools that are like us in other states, join up to compete in a number of um, athletic events and also just to give the students a chance to get to know other kids like themselves. And so often um, that event is hosted here at LSMSA, but students will come to us from Arkansas, sometimes from Alabama, sometimes from Mississippi, and from Texas. And um, it's really an event that our students look forward to each year. Our next area is community involvement. Natchitoches is a great home for LSMSA and there are a number of ways for our students to be involved in the community. One of those is through community service opportunities. Community service is not required at LSMSA, but it is something that we encourage students to participate in if they're able to do so. Ms. Jenny Schmidt tends to be the person who coordinates our community service opportunities, but our students will work at the local food pantry. They will do um, other service projects in the community that give them a chance to give back to Natchitoches. 
We also have a number of students who are involved in religious activities while at LSMSA. Students can attend area churches or places of worship. They can participate in um, youth activities. A number of students will complete their confirmation class while they're at LSMSA and then go home for confirmation. And so there are several ways for students to remain involved and to, to find a place that they can continue to um, worship while they're at LSMSA. We also have a host family program. And the host family program tries to connect students, particularly students from far away who may not get to go home very often, with a family in the Natchitoches area. And that family may be a, a family that takes them to church with them or that invites them over to their home on the weekend um, to maybe do laundry without having to have a roll of quarters to do your laundry or to eat a home-cooked meal. Students that are interested in the host family program complete an application and their parents have to give approval um, for them to, to be paired with the family that has also completed an application to serve as a host family for LSMSA. And then finally we have our work service program. All students at LSMSA complete three hours of work service um, each week. They'll be assigned a work service position and they'll schedule those hours around their class hours. So once they know what their class schedule is, they can um, fit in that work service at times that they, they have some availability in their schedule. Most of our first year students end up doing work service for our cafeteria or with one of our custodial staff members. Those are the areas where we have the most openings for work service. But then after their first year, students will often move to a position in perhaps our writing center, serving as a tutor, working with a faculty or staff member, or working in one of our administrative offices. And so each year, students complete three hours of work service per week and it is a graduation requirement. And it's one of the ways that we keep the cost of LSMSA low for the taxpayers by utilizing our students and their strengths and abilities. The last part of our student services program that I'd like to talk about is the student activities and leadership program. One of the responsibilities of the student life advisors is to make sure that we have a number of activities going on on campus to keep the students busy, to give them an opportunity to blow off some steam, and to make sure that they have the most positive experience possible. To that end, they plan a number of hall parties, um, birthday parties, hall events, most of it involving food. The students are always anxious for, for some extra snacks or treats to eat. Um, and so we'll, we'll do programs on the halls, as well as various campus-wide and building-wide activities. We try to make sure on any weekend that we have at least two opportunities for students, and these would be free events that any student's welcome to attend. And it might be something like, um, you know, a karaoke night, it might be a movie night, we, we do video game nights, we have some major dances throughout the year, um, just ways for the students to, to get together and have a good time with one another. We also have over 50 active clubs and student organizations, and if there's a club that we don't have on campus that a student would like to start, the process of doing so is really easy, and each year we have at least a handful of clubs that are started by students who have new interests or things that they had been doing at their home school that they'd like to bring to our campus, and we're, we're really excited to work with them as, as they bring their ideas to our campus. We also think it's important to help our students develop leadership skills, and so we offer various workshops and, and retreats to help focus on um, those leadership skills that students can be developing at this age. Okay, so the second hat that I wear is the Director of Enrollment Services Office. And so um, as far as our Enrollment Services Office is concerned, I'm not going to go into too much detail because we've posted a lot of information on our website already this year. Um, but in general, the steps to apply to LSMSA, the first thing you would do is complete your online application and then submit your test scores. So whatever test record you can submit to us, LEAP scores, EO score, C scores, those those previous standardized tests that you've completed. We also ask every student to take the ACT or the SAT most years, and this year we will also accept the CLT, PSAT, or the pre-ACT, so any of those test opportunities. And we have a whole other video on our website that will talk a little bit more about those testing opportunities, as well as a video that talks about the application process. In addition to submitting the test scores, you request teacher rec recommendations, you submit your grades to us after you receive your, your fall midterm grades, so we'd be looking to get those grades in late December or maybe early January. 
We ask everybody to complete a campus visit if possible, and then also to complete an interview. And like I said, there's a lot of information on our website about that, and so I'm going to keep it brief right here, um, but you're welcome to visit our website for that information. I'm frequently asked what we're looking for when um, we're looking for an LSMSA student. And so I like to say that the LSMSA student is going to bring strong test scores and good grades. We are interested in your academic background, and these are the best predictors of how you're going to do academically at LSMSA. Um, we're also looking for a superb disciplinary record. Our students do have a certain amount of independence, and we need to know that they're ready for that level of independence, and they're ready to show the level of maturity that's necessary at our school. But we're also looking for students that are hardworking, interested in a challenge, able to work well independently, and able to easily get along with others. And most importantly, we are looking for students that want to attend LSMSA. Um, it's tricky here sometimes. The classes are hard. Living away from mom and dad is hard. And so it's important that this is the student's idea, that it's something that they're really into, um, and that they're really certain that this is the, the right next step for them. And figuring that out can be a process, and we look forward to helping you with that process and answering questions and, and helping you decide if, if this may be a good fit for you. As I mentioned at the start, um, I've been with LSMSA for over 20 years, and I didn't anticipate this to be my, my career path, but I found the school, and I just absolutely fell in love with the place and the students and the opportunity that it provides for, for students in Louisiana. And I do think that attending LSMSA is absolutely a life-changing experience. You bring students to this place where they have this opportunity to really learn to the best of their abilities, to take classes from a faculty that is unmatched in the state, and to learn with one another, to be surrounded by their peers, um, and to do so is, is really just such a tremendous opportunity for them and they grow so much and I find it to be um, a very rewarding place to work and uh, absolutely fantastic opportunity for students in our state. So the next step, if you are interested in continuing um, down the path of applying to LSMSA would be to submit your application. Um, to sign up to take the ACT or the SAT or the CLT and send us your scores, to rec request those recommendations from your faculty, and to submit your grades to us. And we look forward to working with you, and we look forward to answering your questions. I want to thank y'all for joining me today. I've enjoyed talking about the program, and if you have any questions, I look forward to answering those as well. At this point, I'm going to turn the floor over to Dr. Christy Pope Key, our Director of Academic Services, to talk a little bit more about the academic program at LSMSA. Thank you, Ms. Shoemate. I am Dr. Christy Pope Key. I'm the Director of Academics, and I'm so glad you guys are joining us today to talk about academics at LSMSA. I'm in my sixth year here. Prior to coming to LSMSA, uh, I had a 15-year career in the college classroom teaching American Lit and Southern Lit, and, uh, and I really, really enjoy working with our faculty, our students, and our families in making sure that the kids progress towards graduation and have an amazing academic experience. So today I want to spend a little bit of time talking about our foundations in, uh, in the academic areas, and I want to make sure that you all know I'm available to answer any questions you have. So we'll cut to the PowerPoint in just a second, and I look forward to talking with you. So I want to tell you about our current students. Um, it is helpful to see a few data points, I think, about our student population, although this doesn't capture the richness and the depth of their experiences here, and certainly it doesn't capture the whole person um, or the whole community. But sometimes these numbers can be helpful to take a look at. Our class of 2020, the students who just graduated, I want to let you know that 100% of them left LSMSA qualified for TOPS. So giving them good options to stay in state, um, or to return to the state um, for grad school if they'd like. The top quartile ACT of our graduating class in the spring was a 33.8, um, and, uh, and the class average overall was a 29.8. The top quartile GPA cumulative from their work before LSMSA and their time here was a 3.93. I want to let you know that the uh, we don't weight grades here, and when we evaluate a student's transcript, we convert everything to a four-point scale. So sometimes there's a bit of sticker shock for students and parents when they see that, but I want to make sure you're aware. Part of the reason we do this is related to um, 
our approach to, to treat this experience as closely to a collegiate experience as we can. And 97% uh, of our graduates from the class of 20 matriculated to four-year institutions this fall. Two students are taking a gap year to travel and work internships before they attend their chosen colleges um, in the fall of 21. And one student enlisted in the U.S. Marine Corps, and we're very proud of her and proud of that work. We are not an AP school per se, um, but our students are allowed to self-identify and take AP exams should they choose to. Um, we can proctor those exams for the students. So I wanted to let you know how our kids did last spring and last summer with those AP exams. So we had 20 students um, who self-identified to take 25 exams, and 84% uh, of those exams were scored at a three or better. So if you know about the AP system, and again, we're not an AP school, um, but if you know about the AP system, usually the three score is a threshold for collegiate credit. I do want to make sure that you know that we have got um, dual enrollment options every semester for every student at LSMSA. Um, up to 60 courses per semester are eligible for dual enrollment through NSU. And in those cases, what that means is that our faculty are teaching your students in the classroom, but because of our faculty's credentials and because of articulation agreements with NSU, NSU has said they can earn dual enrollment credit for that. So again, dual enrollment at, LS at LSMSA has to do with identifying classes taken here that can be eligible for dual enrollment credit at NSU, and there's no cost associated with that. In addition to some of this data, I want to tell you quickly about the fact that um, we encourage our students to pursue independent studies in the curriculum if they're interested. If there's a class they would like to be taking that we can't pull together a full roster for, they can connect with the faculty and, uh, and pursue an independent studies on that, and we can transcript that. Um, we encourage the students to take summer internships if they can, and we can help facilitate looking for those internships around the state. And we encourage students to consider big research projects. And a lot of times this becomes a, a, a project that we call distinction, where the students can graduate with distinction, um, having produced original research, presented original research to their peers, and we publish that in a bound copy that they can keep forever. Or you, mom and dad, can keep forever on the coffee table if you like. So we're excited about those opportunities to let kids do a deep dive into curriculum they're interested in or into work that they're interested in. We also offer a future scientist program, an artist in training program, again, geared toward students' interests, their um, aspirations, uh, their curiosities. And these are, again, places where they can do a deep dive. All right, let me tell you a little bit about our academic foundations. Our charter dictates that all of our faculty must be university credentialed. Um, that means they have to have a master's degree in the field in which they teach. 78% of our current full-time faculty have PhDs or terminal degrees in their field. Um, so when we're bringing faculty to campus, when we are considering hiring faculty, we need them to have graduate coursework in the field that we're gonna ask them to teach. They're gonna come with academic experiences similar to, if not exactly replicating, a collegiate professor or a university professor. And that's because we teach accelerated and college level coursework on a collegiate model. Um, our coursework is recognized through articulation agreements by every college in the UL system, by Centenary and by Oglethorpe. And that means if your student graduates from LSMSA and wants to go to McNeese or La Tech or Louisiana Lafayette, Louisiana Monroe or Centenary, their transcript will be evaluated looking at that coursework and they may be able to swap out or skip over some university courses based on what they took here. We also offer dual enrollment, I mentioned that a minute ago, through NSU, and we've got associate degrees possibilities through NSU and through ULM that the students can earn alongside their transcript here at LSMSA. We also invest in a college counseling center. We know how important the college search is for our students and our families. We know that that landscape is ever shifting, um, ever changing. And so we've got two full-time certified counselors um, who do seminar coursework each spring with the junior class and then each fall with the senior class. So your students during their time here will get one-on-one -on -one work and small group work with our college counselors. Um, it can be really tricky to, to do a college search from a distance, right? So we want to make sure that the counselors work closely with the families, work closely with the students to find the best fit for your students um, in their higher ed. So I need to tell you about our, our coursework. 
it can be incredibly challenging. We hope that it is always incredibly engaging. And we hope that it feeds your students' senses of curiosity, um, their sense of wonder, um, their sense of academic excellence, but it can be tough. So I want to tell you that their coursework and the material will likely be more challenging than anything they've encountered to date. Um, for a lot of your students, their, uh, their homeschool experiences or their sending school experiences have been really, really good. And maybe they've got one or two classes that require homework of them every night, or one or two classes that sort of keep them on their toes. I need to tell you that they're going to be taking at least six classes here that will have work every day, and it will be substantive and substantial work that they need to do. But I also want to tell you that we have faith in their ability to do this work. We would not invite them to attend here. We would not admit them through admissions if we did not have faith in your students. So while I'm telling you it's going to be really hard academically, I want to tell you that we believe your kids can do it and we believe it's, it's uh, worth the rigor and worth the pace. So our pace, our rigor, our format, our learning outcomes, again, are all on a collegiate model. And I'm going to show you some, some schedules later in this presentation so you can sort of see that brought to life. Our average class size is 12 students. And the students are going to be managing homework and papers, exams and projects alongside the community expectations that they need to follow policies, they need to keep a clean room, they need to communicate with their adults, both on campus and off campus. So Ms. Schumann has talked with you about some of that. Um, know that we reinforce that in academics. Um, know that we see this as a holistic living learning community and we try to tie all of these things together. Um, and know that we're very excited about your kids coming to join us possibly. I'd like to transition quickly to let you get to know some of our faculty sort of briefly. What I want to show you is um, where their degrees are from and some of the things they specialize in and a few um, little items about the ways in which they're not just active in the classroom but also active um, in the whole campus community. So let me introduce you to a, to a few of our faculty. This is Dr. Jason Anderson. He's going to be teaching later today. I think you'll, you'll enjoy uh, spending some time with him. Uh, Dr. Anderson is a lecturer of biology. He came to LSMSA in 2011. Um, he teaches our intro to bio sequence. He teaches modern genetics, uh, principles of genetics. He's got a wildly popular elective called Survey of the Atmosphere that the kids love because they learn about meteorology and, um, and weather patterns. And this is in some ways a pet project for Dr. Anderson, um, but it's a way in which he can give the students some curriculum um, based on his own interests that I think is really fascinating. I also want to highlight for you that Dr. Anderson is the chair of our IDEA Council, a really important group on campus that's doing, doing good work and guided work about issues related to diversity and equity and access. He's also the assistant director of our Excel program, which is a bridge program for underrepresented communities or underrepresented students um, uh, who can come and spend time with us in the summer to prepare for um, uh, entering LSMSA in the fall. He also coaches men's and women's basketball, and he's the sponsor of a B club, right? So what I want to capture for you here is that it is very important what Dr. Anderson does in the classroom, but it's also very important the ways in which he connects with the students outside of the classroom and the ways in which he builds community. I want to offer something similar about Dr. Jocelyn Donlin. She's an associate lecturer in English. She's the department chair of our humanities. She's been at LSMSA since 2013. Um, you can see that she teaches a full suite of English courses, and, um, and she sponsors our Model UN organization. What I want to highlight with Dr. Donlin is that uh, as an academic chair, as the chair of our humanities department, she is going to be a resource for your students and for you all as, fam as families, should you have questions about curriculum, questions about advising, questions about how a course is going. Um, she is going to be, in addition to the faculty that are teaching that course, she's going to be a resource for you. So I want you to know um, that you all are always, always, always welcome to reach out directly to faculty with questions you may have, but also to reach out to department chairs with questions you may have. So Dr. Donlin um, is a fantastic chair. She's a fantastic sponsor. She's uh, brought the Model UN organization back to campus um, thanks to student requests, and, uh, and she does a lot of important work with that. 
I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Randy Key in full disclosure here. Uh, Randy is my husband and, uh, and we are an academic team. He is a, an associate lecturer of mathematics here. Um, he and I both joined LSMSA in 2015. He teaches trig and pre-cal, he teaches calculus three. And I wanna tell you a little bit about the introduction to engineering course that he developed Again, based on student requests and student interests. He had a previous career in engineering with Halliburton, and, uh, and in bringing this course to life, what we're seeing is that um, as many as a third to 40% um, of our kids are interested in engineering fields when they leave LSMSA, and the opportunity to get a little bit of a taste of what that career looks like, what are some of the important theoretical notions of the field in this class has been really important. I also want to let you know about our special projects. Um, each faculty member teaches a special projects week um, in, uh, in January where the kids can sign up for a week-long seminar or a week-long experience in topics of their choosing. This is a graduation requirement. Um, I've noted here that Randy has taught special projects in math, uh, sports and math rather, in engineering our way to Mars, in a pre-calculus boot camp. Um, for a couple of years, he's taken students to Oklahoma to Slumberjay's uh, training facility. So <clears throat> the idea being that not just in the classroom we're exploring some of these ideas, but that we hope to have experiential um, opportunities for the students, and, uh, and special projects is one way that we can, we can accomplish that. Chris King is a lecturer of visual arts. He has been with LSMSA since 2008. Uh, again, teaching a full suite from beginning level to very advanced uh, visual arts courses. Um, his special projects are often centered on um, a deep dive in contemporary art and then a series of museum visits. Um, through support from alum and faculty, he's been able to take students to Houston, to Dallas, uh, to Northwest Arkansas for these experiences. And again, what you see there is the faculty interest and the student interest connecting um, and the opportunity for these deep dives. King is also taking lead on a, a campaign project and a, and a vision project that we're working with our foundation on right now um, for a builder space and an innovation center um, that will be a, uh, a facility that the students can use. Uh, we're gonna have aspects of, a, of an old work, uh, sort of an old school style, uh, uh, builders workshop um, of uh, a, a technology space that will include 3D printers um, and, and laser design cutters of uh, a crafting area of a greenhouse. Um, we're seeing more and more evidence in studies having to do with high achieving kids and gifted kids that when they can find ways to work with their hands, when they can find ways to express creativity in tangible ways, um, that it is really beneficial for their wellness. And so this is part of this vision project that King and other faculty are working closely with our foundation on, is to bring this to life as a new co-curricular space for our kids to enjoy on campus. I want to tell you a quick bit about Dr. Casey Green. She's an associate lecturer of history. Casey is a LSMSA alum herself. And, uh, and after completing her graduate degrees at the University of Connecticut, came back to teach here. She joined LSMSA in 2015. Her special projects um, have been on quilting, uh, have been on Stephen Sondheim musicals, have been on gerrymandering as her interest in American government and American history dovetail there. And I wanna tell you a little bit about, um, I have a note here about May Day campus visits. One of the things that we find when students come to campus that they miss from home um, is their pets. They miss their cats, they miss their dogs, they miss their gerbils. Uh, they tell me they miss their snakes. I'm not sure how to process that, but I believe them. And, uh, and so there are times throughout the semester that faculty and staff will bring their own pets to campus. So Dr. Green will regularly bring um, her golden retriever May Day to campus, maybe on a Saturday afternoon or a Sunday afternoon. And students who want to, nobody has to if they don't want to, but students who want to can hang out with May Day, can pet May Day, they can throw the ball around on the quad. And it just is a, um, a stress reliever for the kids. It's a way for Dr. Green to, to connect with the kids um, and May Day loves every bit of it. And then the last faculty member I wanna tell you a quick bit about is uh, Mr. Leo Eisenlohr. Um, he joined us in 2017. He's an instructor of languages. I'd like to point out that he teaches both Chinese and Arabic um, courses. We have a full two-year curriculum in both areas. This complements our other language offerings in Latin, German, Spanish, and French. Um, 
we're very excited about this curriculum. We feel like this is a, a place, again, to meet students where they're interested, to help them diversify their transcripts, and just to have a great experience with Mr. Eisenlohr. Um, he continues each semester to work with several students on independent studies, um, on either language study or dialect study or calligraphy. Again, the students begin their language study with Mr. Eisenlohr, get interested, look for more ways to deepen their knowledge in the area, and we're really excited to be able to offer that. So those are just a couple of, of snapshots from our faculty. Um, I want to tell you about, I'm going to move on here to talk a little bit about our graduation requirements. Our requirements include or have embedded in them both the TOPS requirements and the Core 4 requirements. So we align with the state expectations in both those areas and then we add a little something extra. So as you know from your own students' experiences, they need to progress through four units of English, four units of math, four units of social studies, and four units of science for the core four. For TOPS, we add in a unit of arts, the two units in language, the unit and a half of PE, the half unit of health, um, and then we add in two units of electives that we would like for them to complete while they're here. And elective options are an important component of our curriculum. And oftentimes, they are going to be that sort of deep dive into the areas that they're interested in. So you're done with your four units in science, but you want to take that meteorology course, or you want to take organic chemistry, or you want to take um, advanced uh, improvisation in the theater cohort. So that sort of deep dive, that, that place for the electives that go above and beyond the core four and above and beyond the tops components is a lot of what we can offer your kids if they come to, to, come to school with us. We also have a series of campus activities and traditions that are really important um, that we can talk more about at a later date, but I've mentioned Special Projects Week. Um, we also have required weekends, uh, usually one or two a semester, where we ask that the students don't go home, um, that they stay on campus for that weekend for some special academic or social or communal programming that we think is important for them. So I mentioned that I wanted to show you um, the schedules of our students. And what I have done here is I've just grabbed three or four um, traditional or fairly common schedules um, and this can demonstrate the ways in which, A, they're going to be taking a lot of classes, and B, um, we run on a collegiate schedule or on a collegiate model. So this is a traditional uh, sophomore schedule for a student who's interested in dance. So what you're going to see in this schedule is they are taking English uh, uh, 110, Intro to Writing Part 1. That's going to be one of their core units in English. They're taking um, biology, they're taking American history, and they're taking geometry. So there they're taking care of their core four classes. This student tested into Spanish too, so they are taking care of their languages. And the student is interested in dance. So they're taking an intro to dance course and another course called body movement that they can use for either PE credit or dance credit. You can see that their classes either meet on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or a Tuesday, Thursday schedule. Our language courses traditionally meet four days a week to have a little bit um, uh, more repetition in that pedagogy in ways that are that are really fruitful for them. But this might be a sophomore schedule. So sometimes when your students come to Exploration Days, um, they're going to see our big long list of classes and they're going to want to jump right into um, quantum mechanics, right? But if they're a sophomore, most of what they're going to take is going to mirror those core areas. But again, these aren't going to be the traditional courses. Um, they're going to be um, laced with a lot of rigor. The pace is going to be pretty quick. There's going to be a lot of reading and a lot of writing, but they're going to be, they're going to love it. I promise you, they're going to be fine. A junior schedule, this is again, it's sort of a typical junior schedule. This is for a student who's interested in the STEM fields. And so you can see that for their junior history course, they've been able to choose a, a class that we teach called History of Modern Science with Dr. Lankford. So we've got a number of history electives, a number of English electives where they can pursue what they're interested in or what they're curious about, and there can be ways that they can diversify their transcript with this. Um, you can see that they're taking both organic chemistry and independent chemistry research and principles of genetics. So this is a kid who's very deep into science, who's interested in science, um, and who uh, is probably working toward our future scientist program certification. I also want to note here, I mentioned earlier that we're not an AP school, but we have one traditional AP class taught in our math department, um, and that is the AP Calculus BC sequence. So that course has been on our books for, um, for I think about a decade now. 
students commit to a year-long study in that course if they choose to take it. And, uh, and at the end of that year-long study, they take the AP exam. Um, so that is our one AP course. Again, if there are other areas where your student is interested in pursuing AP credit, um, they do not have to take the coursework. They can just sign up for the exam and we will proctor that for them. Here is a senior schedule uh, for a student who is uh, very interested in languages. So as they have progressed through our curriculum, they have checked off boxes for the core classes, they have made good progress in their other areas, and they've got space in their schedule to take the things that they're really, really interested in. So this student is second, in second year Chinese and in first year Arabic and in second year French. They're taking advanced Spanish language and culture. This is essentially a fifth year language course. Um, they're taking Gothic Lit, they're taking Astronomy and World History. You see they're doing independent studies in visual arts and in physics. This is, they're working toward a distinction project there. Um, and you can see on their schedule the college planning seminar where they're working with our college counselor on their collegiate search. Now this student had hoped to um, go to university and major in world languages, wanted to, uh, uh, hopes to be a translator. Um, and so, um, and travel the world. So, so these are the ways that, that this student's transcript are going to demonstrate that. And here's a senior schedule for a student who's interested in humanities and science. And again, I just want you to see what they're able to pursue um, as they get into their third year, and, uh, or their second year, but as they get into their senior year, and, um, and the sort of opportunities they may have in terms of coursework. Uh, the student's taking transnational fiction and dystopian literature. Um, they're doing an independent study in English. Um, and, uh, and then from the science side, they're taking quantum mechanics and thermodynamics. So this is a student who has worked hard and worked ahead in their core areas, and they're finishing out this, this senior fall with, uh, with some of these courses that they've, they've been interested in. So I need to tell you a little bit about our academic policies, and I'm going to push through here because I know I've had you for a few minutes. Um, we understand what we're asking of your students. We understand uh, that taking them from a traditional freshman year experience or a traditional sophomore year experience and putting them into a collegiate atmosphere can be really um, tricky. So we have a drop add period at the beginning of each semester where they can make schedule adjustments if they realize that they've got too many classes. Um, we want to keep them full time, but we can we can adjust some things if they realize they have too many Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, and they need more balance in their week, if they realize mon uh, mornings are better than afternoons. So we build in two weeks at the beginning of each semester, again, just like a college would, to make adjustments to their schedule. Um, our attendance policies are incredibly strict. Um, attendance is taken by class throughout the day. So if you have an 11.30 class, a 1.30 class, and a 2 o'clock class, your attendance is going to be taken in each of those classes. And, um, and if a student misses four classes in a single course, four class periods in a single course, they're going to fail that class according to our policy. That's how important we believe it to be that they come to class, that they are present and active and participating. If a student has 10 unexcused absences overall, they will be asked to return home. Again, that's indicative of our campus values and how important we think it is. We also think it's important that we know throughout the day where your kids are. Um, if you believe they're in an 11:30 class and I believe they're in an 11:30 class, then we want them in that class. So, um, so we really drill this into the students. We really reinforce this with the faculties uh, and with the families. Um, and I also need to let you know that at at LSMSA, if a student is struggling, anything below a 70% is a D, and a D is a failing course grade. This doesn't happen often, but it does happen. And, uh, and we've got a couple of ways to remedy that. If your student is struggling in a course or struggling in a couple of courses at the end of the semester and they end up with a D, um, we've got some policies that allow for grade forgiveness or credit recovery. Um, but also, should you choose to take your child back to the homeschool, that D will carry credit with the homeschool. So we don't ever want a student's experience here to put them behind in terms of graduation requirements or put them behind in terms of progressing toward graduation in the eyes of the state. So regardless of what the, the percentage grade is, a D at home will carry credit. Um, and so we've got that sort of uh, safety net built in should you find that you need to take your kid, home, your, your kid back to their home school. When we see students struggle, um, we begin to try to bring them into the academic fold with guided study, 
with supervised study, with office hours in the faculty offices, and we try to involve the parents. Again, I'm gonna ask you, should your students join us, that you help us keep an eye on grades, you uh, check in to our course management software that I'm gonna show you in just a second, and, uh, and that you get us in dialogue whenever you feel the need. Um, parenting from afar can be really tricky. Um, working with your students' academics from afar can be really tricky. And highly motivated, high achieving, gifted kids are gonna tell you, mom, I've got it, dad, I've got it. But if you feel like they don't have it, let's get all the adults in a conversation and let's see what we can do to support your students. I want to show you a couple of screens from our course management software because we feel like this is an important part of parental support. Um, this is what you can see of your student's schedule when you log in to Miles MSA from the academic portal. Um, some of you have already worked in Miles MSA through the admissions portal, so you're going to get familiar with some of these processes. But you can see what classes they're taking, what their schedule is for that Monday. Um, you can see that for this student, they attended their 930 class. Uh, Mr. Eisenlohr at 10.30 should put in the attendance. You'll be able to see that they're there for that. Um, they've got a break in their day until 1 o'clock. Dr. Landry will put in attendance. And so you can check that, they're, that they are attending class. Also, any of those courses are hyperlinked. So where you see the blue um, lettering, you can drill in and see additional information. This is another place in the system where you can see your students' grades. So you can see for this student in history of the Cold War, they've got a 90.94%. And you can drill into that grade percentage. You can see what they grow out on each assignment, um, if they have any missing assignments. This also demonstrates, for example, that they have outstanding assignments in visual arts and in Python. They're not due yet on the day that they're due. That, uh, that little red one next to active will trigger up to do today, and you'll be able to help track that way. And when you drill into the course, so there you see Exploring Visual Arts with Chris King, if we were to be able to be clicking on that, you could see his course page with his syllabus, his office hours, his contact information. Um, you can push in and see assignments. All of this is meant to connect you to the curriculum, to connect the students to the curriculum, and I'll offer that this semester in particular, we have taught almost entirely through this portal for our online students and, and the online class experience that we've, uh, that we've chosen for fall 20. And it's a very robust system that you guys can, can spend a lot of time in and gain a lot of knowledge out of. I wanna quickly highlight um, some of the electives that students can pursue beyond the core four level here. This is in our math and computer science department. Um, you can see a number of computer science courses, app development, robotics, programming with Python, cybersecurity, in addition to our high-level math courses in DIFFEQ and linear algebra and topology. In the science areas, we've got courses in zoology, genetics, astrobiology, human anatomy, thermodynamics. This is all above the traditional intro to bio, intro to chemistry, intro to physics courses that your kids can take here. In humanities, you'll see some of the deep dive in women's history, creative writing, European intellectual thought, the American Revolution, the history of the American West. Again, these are places where they can take the traditional American history, the traditional civic sequence, the traditional world sequence, but they can also take these electives for core credit, particularly in this department, and really flesh out on their transcript the high-level work that they're doing at LSMSA. In our arts area, and I've not told you nearly enough about our arts department, we've got beginning courses in dance, theater, uh, piano, uh, chorale, and visual arts. We've got advanced instrumental and um, music theory courses, advanced level dance courses, advanced level theater courses, advanced level visual arts, um, advanced level piano courses, advanced level voice courses. Um, and what we always hope is that students who do not have previous arts experience will find an entry point to pursue that should they're interest, interested. But students who bring to us years of experience in these places will also find a curriculum that interests them and that they can pursue. Um, every year we get kids who are convinced they are gonna go and uh, be STEM kids in college and they take an acting class with Mr. Terrio and boom, suddenly they're looking at theater schools. And I always want to tell the parents, I am, you know, 
I know that engineering degree sounded great, but look how happy your kids are. Um, and a lot of times we see them pursuing both areas equally, and that's really exciting too. So the arts component at LSMSA is vitally important to our community. Um, and we're really grateful that the state allows us to pursue this alongside the other areas um, and super proud of our arts faculty. So those are some of the electives. That's some of the stuff that the kids can get into eventually when they're here. And I just want to talk a little bit about next steps. When students complete the curriculum, when they complete their time with LSMSA, we are very proud to send them off to college and university well prepared and, um, and ready essentially to conquer the world, but certainly to conquer un undergrad. I want to tell you that year in and year out, nearly 60% of our students stay in state. Um, they take advantage of TOPS, they take advantage of articulation agreements, um, and they stay you know, close to home. Um, I have here a select listing of colleges attended out of state over the last three years. And what I want to highlight for you here is on this list, you will see Ivy League schools, you will see elite colleges on the West Coast, you will see big research institutions and land grant institutions, but I also want you to see small liberal arts colleges, I want you to see small um, engineering schools and dedicated uh, spaces where the kids can pursue in a smaller environment their interest. Um, <clears throat> our goal is always, always, always for the student and the family to feel good about that collegiate choice. I am just as proud of a student who finds their home at an in-state school with a degree that they're excited about as I am of the kids who, uh, who pursue work in the Ivies or the Seven Sisters um, or engineering schools. My goal, our staff's goal, our faculty's goal is that the kids and the families find the right fit. So know that that's going to be our support um, throughout their time here. That's going to be the message from my desk throughout their collegiate search. And, uh, and know that we're really excited about the possibility of you and your students becoming part of the LSMSA family. I'm going to step away now. I'm going to turn things back over to the folks in admissions. Thank you for your time. Please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I am at kkey at lsmsa.edu. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Key and Ms. Shoemate. Over the last several weeks, we've been able to bring students back to campus to take the ACT and the PSAT, so we haven't been exactly virtual this semester. We were able to see several of our, our returning classmates and even a lot of new ones on the campus. They were able to spend the nights in the residence halls. They were back in the buildings, uh, of course, practicing all good things that go um, with, with keeping themselves and ourselves well. Um, it made us realize how much we miss the students. And, and, and we're moving toward uh, a reunion of the student body, hopefully as early as this spring. But right after the PSAT, Mr. Mike Sumner gathered a group of students um, to talk to them about the Louisiana School experience and, and things that they may want to share with you as you consider your Louisiana School experience. Mr. Sumner. Hey everyone, Dr. Horton, thank you for that really warm welcome. It means a lot to me to hear that I'm your favorite employee. Wait, what? He didn't say that? Are we sure? I really thought he would. We can just like edit him in saying that, right? That hurt. Anyway, uh, welcome to our student Q&A session. Uh, as you may be aware, for this fall of 2020, we've been online only, but this morning we actually had some students come into campus to take the PSAT as part of the National Merit Qualifying System. So I figured as long as they were here, I'd invite some of them to come by after the test and stop by my office so that we could film uh, them answering some of our more frequently asked questions. And so, uh, because we're filming this in advance of airing it, uh, I'm also asked them to be online whenever it airs. So if you wanna put any questions in the comment section, hopefully they'll be able to answer those for you. And before I let them introduce themselves, I just wanna take a moment to just sincerely thank them. Um, the PSAT is a fairly long test and I'm sure that coming in to answer questions is one of the last things they wanted to do. Uh, so on behalf of myself and all of you watching at home, I wanna thank them for coming in and spending a little bit of time doing this with me. So I'm gonna go ahead and shrink down my screen here. All right. And I'm gonna let them introduce themselves. Tum Tum, why don't you get us started? Hi, my name is Tum Tum and I'm from Natchitoches, Louisiana. 
Hi, I'm Brady Covington, and I'm from Walker, Louisiana. Hi, I'm Libby Zachary, and I'm from Lafayette, Louisiana. Hello, guys. My name is Isaac LeCompte, and I am from Houma, Louisiana. Hi, I'm Ella Abney, and I'm from Slido, Louisiana. All right. So what I'm going to do is ask this group a handful of questions. And in order to keep this along, I'm only going to ask two or three students to answer each one. So I'll start off with a pretty basic question. I want to know what led you to leave your home and your school uh, two to three years early and come to LSMSA. So let's say Livy and Tum Tum. Why don't y'all take this one? Honestly, it was the opportunity. Um, I was previously homeschooled before LSMSA, so I wasn't in that traditional public school environment. And while homeschool obviously offers great opportunities, the ones offered at LSMSA are just, they can't be beat. Um, and between that and the sense of community that I saw from my first exploration day between not only the faculty amongst themselves, the students amongst themselves, but faculty and students together, it was, there was no question. I was drawn to Ellison to say because of the course options is one of the really big things. My sister had already been here for about two years before it was time for me to apply. And she just seemed to be having such a great experience that I wanted to get to try and have it too. So I applied. Good answers. For this next question, let's hear from our other three students. So let's say Brady, Ella, and Isaac. What do y'all like to do for fun around here? The most fun thing to do while you're here is to go out on, oh, well, we might not be able to do this anymore. To go out on Front Street on the weekends and just stay out till curfew and just walk around with your friends and go by the, it's just so, it's just such a fun experience. Just walking down and I don't know, you have to do it yourself. Really anything. <laughs> like I find I have most fun weirdly enough when I'm doing like homework and stuff because me and my friends are just messing around and making fun of each other and things like that. Um, but going around Natchitoches like to Front Street and stuff is actually really fun like during the weekends. Okay so this is going to sound really geeky um, but I, me and like five other guys would get together like every weekend and play this game called Twilight Imperium. Okay. Let's say it's like a seven to eight hour board game. Best thing to do on the weekend. But it's also very geeky. <laughs> Isaac, I appreciate the honesty. For my next question, I want to know what's your favorite class or your favorite thing to do here on campus? So I have to go back to you, Isaac. But then let's also hear from Tum Tum and Livy. My favorite class would probably be the Chinese class because one, I don't know, it's, it's fun to relearn something you've lost even though it's extremely difficult to learn. And it's just, you know, it's something you don't normally have. You don't normally have, you know, Chinese or Arabic or German at most schools. So it's a unique kind of lesson that you're allowed to hear to have. My favorite class would probably be American History with Dr. Langford, which I took my sophomore year. And that class is super fun. I wasn't really much of a history kid before I came, but just the way that she got involved with us and made sure that we all understood what was going on and was available for questions or help anytime we needed it was really exciting and made the class super fun. Definitely the theater program. I've met a lot of like-minded kids who are really passionate about acting as well. And being able to blossom in that community and blossom in that realm of study has been something that I feel like I wouldn't get in outside education. Excellent. Thank you all. For this next question, let's say Ella and Tum Tum, why don't y'all tell me how the school compares to your old school? A hundred times harder. <laughs> um, uh, it's a lot like I'd say college because in at my old high school, um, the classes were more like here's a worksheet, do it in class and then do your homework. But here you just have to sit and listen to your teacher's lecture for an hour and um, it goes by really fast and there's not much time for questions and stuff so you just have to really pay attention but I like the environment a lot more because I feel like I'm learning more and I'm enjoying learning more than I did in my other school. The class options that we have are definitely better than the old school like the electives that they offer and all subjects are definitely more like more in-depth and better than the course options from my old school. I think the classes are definitely harder too 
which is what I enjoy. Like I enjoyed the lecture format a lot and you could learn how to take really good notes and it's really good preparation for college. Great. For this next one, I'd like Isaac and Brady. Why don't y'all tell me a little bit about your toughest adjustment in adapting to life here at LSMSA? I would say probably the hardest adjustment for myself would be maintaining like a healthy lifestyle, maintaining a good um, eating diet, of uh, spending habits and all that. Just making sure you, I'm not overspending, I'm not overindulging or underindulging, I guess. So yeah, just making sure I'm healthy. <laughs> I got, I kind of got in the habit um, of not really doing work because I never really needed to. I, because it, it just came naturally at my old school. So I didn't really put like a lot of effort in at first. And then I learned the hard way that you need to here. Um, and that kind of whipped me into shape. All right. Those are excellent answers. Uh, but I think you'll find that Brady's in particular rings true for a lot of our students. Uh, even if you adapt pretty well to the increase in difficulty, there's still going to be a lot more independent work required. Uh, and you really don't want to fall behind in that stuff because it is going to be really hard to kind of pull back up out of that hole. Uh, for my next question, I'd like to go back to Brady and then Ella, why don't you tell me what the most important thing is to know or bring whenever you're moving into the residence halls? Uh, the thing with new kids is you always want to overpack and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It's just you're going to have to bring a lot of it home or if you don't, it's your room's going to be very cluttered throughout the year. Um, I don't think there's really one specific thing I use the most other than like my laptop and don't forget your charges because it's gonna suck. Um, but yeah, just try not to overpack. You probably won't use half the things you bring. Uh, dehumidifier. Admirably succinct, Ella. Livy, you're the smallest of our panel members. Why don't you tell us how safe you feel here on campus at LSMSA? I feel really safe. Um, the campus itself is, it's a pretty good area. Um, I carry my keys and a whistle on me at all times, but other than that, as long as I stick with a friend, I've never felt significantly unsafe. And even if you do, there's always a friend or a teacher around that you can ask to kind of accompany you or just make you feel more at home. Awesome, thank you. For our last couple of questions, I actually wanna hear from everybody in the group. So first, can y'all tell me something that you wish you would have known sooner? Uh, something that you wish somebody would have told you uh, whenever you first started here at LSMSA. Uh, Isaac, why don't you start us off? Uh, probably, I wish they would tell me to like connect with people not only in your grade, but also people in other grades. So now you only have people that you can connect with when you're on your free time. But you have mentors that can kind of guide you and be that person that you could aspire to become. Don't procrastinate. <laughs> because it really catches up and you can't catch up because you'll lose sleep if you try and catch up. Oh, I know. Don't try and take a bunch of classes when you first start. Like, it's okay if you're only taking the minimum required amount of classes. Eventually you'll find your groove and you'll find what you're here for and more classes you want to take. But don't be worried because kids are taking way more classes than you and feel the need that you do too. So my biggest thing would definitely be to take it seriously, but don't take yourself too seriously. Because, yeah, the classes and the rigor here requires a certain level of seriousness, but you've only got three years here, maybe two if you're a new junior. So you've got to make the most of that time because it's extremely finite. And, yeah, go to Chick-fil-A with your friends that night. Go to Friend Street with them. Go annoy your dorm mates because they're not going to be there forever. And yeah, things get tough sometimes, but that makes it all worth it because that's what you're going to look back on in 20 years. So That we all belong here, no matter what your ACT score was, no matter what your grades were, you got accepted for a reason and you are no less than anyone else here. Even if they had an eight point better ACT, you were just as relevant and deserve to be here just as much. That's a really great point, Brady. A lot of our students come from a variety of backgrounds and capabilities, and not everyone's had the same access to the same helpful resources growing up. But our enrollment services team wouldn't accept anybody if we didn't think that they were going to have a chance to be successful here at the Louisiana School. 
Uh, so guys, for your final question, I want to know, what's the number one piece of advice that you would give to new students? My number one piece of advice would be, don't be afraid to ask for help. Everybody here wants to help you and wants to see you succeed, including the faculty, staff, your friends. Everybody's going to be there if you aren't afraid to ask for it. I would say uh, if you're a STEM kid, don't just focus on STEM. And if you're a art kid, don't just focus on art. Explore, you know, do some sports. Do a lot of arts if you haven't done arts. Do a lot of STEMs if you haven't done STEM. Because, you know, the school is really good at, you know, focusing, like giving you what you need. But it also has a lot of things that you might not think you're interested in. For instance, I do, I'm doing a lot of sports and I'm thoroughly enjoying it, even though I'm not athletic, not one bit. My number one piece of advice is to make good choices. If, if your future self would look back and be like, oh my God, that's so embarrassing, or I regret that, just don't do it. Just, just think, think before you do, think before you say, yeah. Be very open-minded and as hard as it may be to adjust, um, just try your best to make the best of it. And if you go into like hearing all these, like how the classes are hard and it's gonna be hard being away from your family, like don't go into it with um, like a bad mindset because then you're gonna have a bad experience. But if you go into it with an open mind and ready for really great experiences and great relationships and a great time, then you're going to have a great time. Whenever things get tough initially, don't let that deter you from continuing because things are going to get really rough right at the beginning because these classes are really rigorous. They're not what they're what you're used to. You're moving away from home at 15, 16. And between all of that, navigating a new social life, it's it's really tough and it's really easy to get bogged down. It's really easy to get unmotivated and feel like this isn't the place for you, but I promise it is. You're going to find your place here. You're going to find your rhythm and things will come together. So just stick it through. It's worth it. All right. All great advice. Uh, guys, any last words before we end the program? Go, go Eagles! Eagles. Woo! <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, so once again, a sincere thank you to all these students for giving up some free time to come and be a part of this. Thank you again to Dr. Horton for emceeing, and I'm going to send it back to him so you can enjoy the rest of the program. Thank you. I want to echo Mr. Sumner's thanks to that group of students who took the PSAT and stopped by and spent even more time with us to answer questions for you, especially those that may be really considering a Louisiana school experience. They had been with us four hours taking that test, so I know they're exhausted, but they still gave it their all, and I think you'll benefit from that experience. For our, our next, we're going to welcome some of our teachers, and first we're going to introduce Mr. Randy Key, a professor of mathematics who's going to give you an interesting explanation about the number one, and then he's going to let you see a portion of one of his pre-calculus mathematics classes uh, that was filmed earlier. So Mr. Key. Hey Future Eagles, I'm Randy Key. I'm a math professor here at the Louisiana School. I teach Introduction to Engineering, Algebra, Trig, and I teach the Multivariable Calculus class. And as a mathematician, one of the things that we often say is that uh, one plus one equals three for extremely large values of one. So in honor of that, what I want to do for you now is to prove that one equals two, and I will do that uh, based on some introductory algebra, but I need to review a tiny bit of it, uh, multiplication. So. This says x plus two times x minus two. And in my algebra class, I learned to multiply these guys that I want to use the FOIL technique. So I'll say x times x is x squared. x times negative two is negative two x. Two times x is two x. And two times negative two is minus four. But when we combine like terms, these guys cancel, and I'm left with x squared minus four. So what I want to know is can I go more quickly from this to this, so if I try a similar example and instead look at maybe x plus three times x minus three, I wonder, does that equal x squared minus nine? And to confirm that it does, we can just do the multiplication again. x times x is x squared. x times minus three is minus three x. Three times x is three x. 
and then three times negative three is minus nine. Notice again, these terms cancel, so I get x squared minus nine. So this has a special name. What I actually wanna do is not go from here to here, but the other order. I wanna go from here and rewrite it as a product. So if I had a x squared minus 25, I might recognize that it looks very much like this one or this one, so I would hope that this is x plus five times x minus five. If you want to double check my math, you'll see again the x times x is x squared, the five times negative five is the minus 25, and the other two terms are going to cancel. This thing has a name that's called a difference of squares. It doesn't have to be x squared and 25, it could be literally anything that's squared in the first and the second position. This one would be x plus y times x minus y. And the one that I think we'll see this time is if we have a squared minus b squared, we'll be able to write that as a plus b times a minus b. So this is just an algebra review. What does it have to do with proving that one equals two? Well, let's see. To prove one equals two, what I want to do now is use an algebra approach, so I'm going to choose a couple of variables to do some work for me. So I'm going to let the variable b equal the variable a. And now I'm just going to apply some algebra. Anything I do to one side, I'll have to do to the other side. The first thing I want to do is multiply both sides by a, and when I do that, I'll get a b on the left is equal to a times a, that's a squared. The next thing I'll do is subtract a number from both sides, but I'm not sure what that number will be. So I'm gonna subtract b squared from both sides of the equation. So I'll have ab minus b squared on the left and a squared minus b squared on the right. So what I recognize is a squared minus b squared. This is why we reviewed this over here. I just learned that a squared minus b squared is equal to this special product. This is factoring the right-hand side. So the right-hand side has to be a plus b times a minus b. The left-hand side, to factor it, I just look for a common factor. So this is undoing the distributive property. I have a b here and here, so if I factor a b out, I'd be left with a minus b. And if you double check that when you distribute b times a is a b, b times negative b is negative b squared. So then when I take a look at this, I see that there's a factor of a minus b on the left. There's a factor of a minus b on the right. So at this stage, I would divide both sides by a minus b. So if this guy times him is equal to this guy times him, then these guys have to be the same. So b is equal to a plus b. And now we just refer back to the assumption we made to begin with, b is equal to a. So that means everywhere I have a b, I can put an a, or if you like everywhere I have an a, I can put a b. So we get b is equal to b plus b or b is equal to 2b. If I choose to divide both sides by b, I can do that, or since this is true for any values a and b, I can just let b equal one. If b equals one, we have one equals two times one, or one equals two. At Louisiana School, anything is possible. Hey guys, I'm gonna shoot a quick video here for you. Um, this is based on the review session that we did on Zoom a little bit ago. You asked that we do it on the patio, on the chalkboard. I looked over those uh, review problems that I sent you in terms of the ration function. I've chosen three of those to work for you as quickly as I can. They are, I think, problems three, six, and seven, but I'm going to work them in reverse order. They all have a little bit of nuance going on. So if you can fast forward, if you're happy with problem number seven, you want to fast forward to six or three, we can do that. So uh, I've got problem number seven here. Y equals X minus one over X times X minus three, and I need to find those things indicated on the review. I may step off screen so you can see some of the work. The zeros of this function are the values for x that make the top zero. The only thing that makes the top zero here is x equal one. Its multiplicity is the number of times that factor appears. X minus one is up there once, so it has a multiplicity of one. Next up is the vertical asymptotes. The vertical asymptotes occur at the values for x when the denominator uh, is made zero. So we have x times x minus three. So my vertical asymptotes will be at x equals zero, because x equals zero would make this guy zero, x equals three. Each of these factors in the denominator appears only once, so their multiplicities are each one. 
The next thing we need is the end behavior. The end behavior for a rational function can do one of three things. It can level off at some uh, horizontal asymptote. It can go up or it can go down. Now we know about going up and going down. We're used to that from polynomial functions. These are a little bit uh, different in terms of finding that. So what I look at is the degree of the numerator and the denominator. And all, I'm gonna work three problems and each one has a different case. The degree upstairs of this guy is one, it's linear. Downstairs, if I multiply that together, the degree downstairs is two. If the degree of the denominator is greater than the degree of the numerator, then you have a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. So that's my end behavior. So this thing has a horizontal asymptote. at y equals zero. Now if I'm following directions, the next thing it says is to find the y-intercept. I usually save that for last. This guy doesn't have a y-intercept, and I know that because we have a vertical asymptote at x equals zero. How do you find a y-intercept? You plug in x equals zero. If I plug x equals zero into this, I get undefined, which means this function doesn't have a y-intercept. So even though I would normally save it for the end, this one doesn't have one anyway. I think I'm ready to try to graph this thing. Things that are important to me are one, zero, and three. So I want to make sure I have one, zero, and three laid out here. So I can say that this is one. So this is three, one, and zero. Now what's going on? The zeros occur at x equal one. That's a point that hits the x-axis. Another zero is at x equal three. That's a point that hits the x-axis. But the, oops, I did that wrong. The zeros are x equal one. The vertical asymptotes, R at x equal three. So a vertical asymptote is not a point my graph hits. It's a imaginary vertical line that my function can't intersect. It'll approach it either going upwards or downwards. So at x equal three, I'm gonna dash this line. So when I graph this, I know that I will approach either going upwards or downwards on either side. I also have an asymptote at x equals zero. It's hard to dash the y-intercept, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Just so when I graph, I remember, hey, I have a vertical asymptote there. The next thing I need is the end behavior. The end behavior is a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. y equals zero is the x-axis. So I'm going to dash my x-axis out here at the end. So I know when my graph gets very, very large, I'm sure when my x values get very, very large, they won't go up, they won't go down, they will level off and approach this line asymptotically either from above or from below. Normally, it doesn't matter if approach approaches from above or below if I have a horizontal asymptote, but because this asymptote is the x-axis, what I've discovered here is I'm not exactly sure where to begin my graph. Usually I would start at end behavior, but I can't do that in this case. So this is the rare case where I need another point. It doesn't matter which point. I need to choose a value for x that isn't one, zero, or three. So ask you, what's your favorite number? You can choose anything you want. I'm gonna choose a large number, something bigger than three, so I can identify the end behavior. What's your favorite number bigger than three? A hundred. Why am I choosing a hundred? Because I don't care what the y value is, I just care if it's positive or negative. So go with me on this. A hundred minus one is 99, that's positive. A hundred is positive. A hundred minus three is 97, that's positive. So I end up with a positive number over a positive number times a positive number. Positive times positive is positive, positive divided by positive. So what did I learn? That when x is very large, the y value is positive. That's all I need to know I'm ready to graph this thing. I'm gonna graph it from right to left. When x is very large, my y value is positive. But it doesn't go up, it must approach this as an asymptote. So I know now it approaches from above. And now I'm just gonna follow my nose. I'm gonna graph this going this way. I'm looking for zeros, and I'm looking for vertical asymptotes. The first thing I encounter is a vertical asymptote. I only have two choices. I can approach it going upwards or downwards. I'll run through both options each time. I, I can do this. I cannot turn and go down. The only way I can do that is by crossing the x-axis, and I don't have any zeros, so I have to approach going upward. The next thing I'll use is the multiplicity. At x equal three, the multiplicity was one. Because the multiplicity is one, that's an odd number, so remember that means my signs change. At x equal three on the right, my y value is positive. So on the left, I need to change y values so my y value will be negative. That tells me I'm going down along this vertical asymptote on the left. Still following my nose, looking for the next thing. The next thing I encounter is a zero. So I need to go intersect at this zero. Remember, if the multiplicity is odd, I will change y value. 
If the multiplicity is even, I will touch it and keep the same y value. x equal 1 is my 0. Its multiplicity is 1. That's an odd number. So what does that look like? I get to cross my x-axis there. The next thing I encounter is a vertical asymptote. Remember, I have two choices. I can go up or I can go down. Cannot turn and go down because I don't cross the x-axis. So I have to go up and approach that as an asymptote. Immediately to the right, my y value is positive. So immediately to the left, I'll either keep the same y value or I will change y value. x equals 0, multiplicity 1, that's odd. So I'm changing y values again. So I'm approach going upwards on the right, I'll have going downwards on the left. And now I'm going this way. I'm still looking for zeros. Oh, I don't see any zeros. I'm still looking for vertical asymptotes. I don't see any more vertical asymptotes. If I don't have zeros or vertical asymptotes, I must be at the end. That's why I use the language the end behavior. What happens at the end? A horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. So I need to approach the line y equals zero. That's the x-axis. This is the graph of y equals x minus one over x times x minus three. I will point out a couple things here for you. One is, even though this uh, has a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero, it also crosses that, vertical, that horizontal asymptote. Functions may cross their horizontal asymptotes. They may not cross a vertical asymptote. Now, why is that? Because horizontal asymptotes aren't what you can't do. Horizontal asymptotes are your end behavior. All they tell me is what happens out here and out here. And if in the middle, I cross over it, that's good. So this is a pretty good graph. I'll pause this, and then we'll start right back up with exercise six. And we're back. Here's exercise six, which reads negative two x squared plus five x plus three over x squared plus two x plus one. And we want to graph this rational function. We need to figure out the same things we did before. It looks like we need to find the zeros, the vertical asymptotes, and the end behavior. Notice these are in expanded form. Well, this is something we've been practicing with polynomials. I'm going to treat these independently. What I want to do with just this polynomial. Maybe I need to use the rational root theorem or the Cartes rule of signs. But each of these is quadratic, and they both factor. So I factored them a moment ago, and now I'll just show you what that factorization looks like. But if you want to pause the video and double check that you can factor each of these, go ahead. So here's the factored form for this rational function y. And now that it's factored, I think you'll be able to find each of these easier. The zeros are the values number that make the upstairs, the numerator zero. 2x plus 1 is the factor. The zero is x equal to negative 1 half. x minus 3 is the factor, so the zero is x equal to 3. The multiplicity for each of those is 1. The vertical asymptotes occur when the denominator is zero. X plus one is the factor, so that vertical asymptote is X equal negative one, and its multiplicity is two. Remember I said the end behavior was all about the degree of the numerator or the denominator. In exercise seven, the degree of the denominator was bigger, so we had a horizontal asymptote at Y equals zero. Let's look at this one. I'm gonna look back at this one, and I'm not even interested in all of this stuff. I'm only interested in this guy and this guy. The degree upstairs is two, the degree downstairs is two. If the degree upstairs and the degree downstairs are the same, you have a horizontal asymptote at y equal the quotient of the leading coefficient. So I have a horizontal asymptote at y equal, well, let's see, what's the leading coefficient upstairs? Negative two, the leading coefficient downstairs understood one, negative two over one. So I have a horizontal asymptote at y equal negative two. Notice I haven't found my y-intercept yet. I can do that in a moment with your help, but I don't think I'm going to need it in this case because of the end behavior. To clarify, I need it because the question asks me to include it. I don't need it in order to graph. So the values I'm interested in are x equal negative 1 half, 3, and negative 1. So I want to make sure those are really identified. So here's negative 1, negative 1 half, 1, 2, 3. So there's the values I'm interested in. The zeros occur at negative one half, that's an actual point. And x equal three. And I have a vertical asymptote at x equal negative one. Remember those vertical asymptotes are a dashed line that my graph will approach. 
Next, I have n behavior. Is it y equal negative 2? Since my n behavior is y equal negative 2, I'm going to find the line y equal negative 2. So it's my, my graph, my scale. So maybe negative 2 is here. So I'll tell my reader what that value is, and then I'll dash that line. That should be the horizontal line, right? So what does that mean? That when x gets very large, what does very large mean in this case? Anything bigger than 3, my graph will approach this asymptote, maybe from below, maybe from above, but either way, those y values will have to be negative. Likewise, when x is very small, less than negative 1, I know I'm going to approach this asymptote. In this case, I can graph from the left or the right. I'm standing over here on the left, so I'll graph from the left. So the first place I'm going to put my pencil is next to this asymptote because I know when x gets very small, I approach this asymptote. Now I'm going to work my way back to the right. The first thing I encounter is a vertical asymptote. Remember, this is y equal negative 1. Oh, no, it's not. Yeah, it is. So negative 1 is the value. So I have two choices. My graph can approach the asymptote going upwards or approach the asymptote going downwards. Can't cross the vertical asymptote. Will you tell me if I'm going this way, can I go up? And what you discover is that you cannot because to do that, I would have to cross the x-axis and I don't have any zeros in here. So it must go down. So that also tells me where I'm going to draw it. I'm choosing to draw it on the bottom of this asymptote. We mentioned last time that a function can cross its horizontal asymptote. So if you wanted to get creative and cross over this asymptote and then approach from above, that's actually okay. We don't know for sure it doesn't do that. What it doesn't do is intersect the x-axis up here. Okay? All right, so here I am. Y equal negative 1 was this vertical asymptote. Immediately to the left, my y value is negative. What I'm going to try to figure out now is does the y value change signs or does it keep the same sign? That's indicated from the multiplicity. X equal negative 1 is my asymptote. The multiplicity is 2. That's an even number. If the multiplicity is even, remember, we keep the same sign. If this were a 0, it would look like it bounces. In this case, it's going to be negative on the left and also negative on the, oops, negative on the right side. So it's going to approach the asymptote the same direction from both sides. The next thing I see is just 0 all the way up here. I wish I had drawn this higher, so I have to come up here and intersect with this zero. Notice again, I'll be crossing the horizontal asymptote, and that is totally fine. I have to intersect at negative one half. The multiplicity is one, so I'm going to cross over the x-axis to do that. And I'm coming back to x equal three. At x equal three, my multiplicity is one. Again, that's an odd number. I'm going to cross the x-axis, and then I can approach my end behavior. So this looks like the graph. 10-point quiz. I just got 9 out of 10. How do I get that last point? Remember, the directions ask me also to find the y-intercept. What I'm going to do is do some confirmation techniques. Based on my graph, the y-intercept better be a positive y-coordinate. So I'm just going to look and see. Remember, I can plug 0 in for x in the factored form, but here's a case where we have it in expanded form. If x is 0, all this goes to 0. I'm left with 3 over 1. 3 divided by 1 is 1. So the y-intercept, remember that was the question, is the answer is 0, 3, and I can indicate that over here by just telling my reader that we hit here at y equals 3 is the y-coordinate of the y-intercept. So this is the graph of problem number 6 on those exercises. We're going to come right back and look at problem number 3 as the final example. g of x equals x minus 1 squared over x plus 2. Now with a little bit of practice, I think we know what we're doing. The zeros occur when the numerator is 0. The only value that makes the top 0 is x equal 1, because that factor is being squared, its multiplicity is 2. The vertical asymptote occurs when the denominator is 0, x plus 2, so the vertical asymptote is at x equal negative 2, and that multiplicity is 1. The end behavior, in our last two examples, we had a horizontal asymptote. That horizontal asymptote was at the x-axis, y equals 0, when the degree of the numerator was larger than the degree of the numerator. In the second example, we had a horizontal asymptote at y equal negative 2. That was the quotient of the leading coefficients because the degree of the numerator was equal to the degree of the denominator. So we look at the degrees here. The degree upstairs, remember, if we expanded this, we don't have to do this, but we would get x squared minus 2x plus 1 over x plus 2. So the degree upstairs is 2. The degree downstairs is 1. So here's the case where the degree of the numerator is bigger than the degree of the denominator. In that instance, you have no horizontal asymptote. So I don't have a horizontal 
But that doesn't mean I don't have in behavior. So this is the one that's most confusing when you work because you often say, well, there's no horizontal asymptote, so you're done. We still want to know what the end behavior is. It's actually not tricky at all to discover. So this goes to the question about how do you find an oblique asymptote, which I will comment on in a second. But first, I'm going to tell you all we need to know. I'm going to get rid of everything except the leading terms. So I'll get x squared over x. Reduce that fraction. What is x squared over x? It looks like y equals x. Take out your finger and draw the line y equals x, and it will look like this. So what does that mean? That the right-hand side is going up and the left-hand side is going down. Think about polynomials. That's the end behavior for our function as well. So now I know my end behavior is up on the right and down on the left. And I'm totally fine with you uh, identifying your end behavior with two arrows. We talked about that in the session. So that's it. I know the end behavior. I know the zeros. I know the vertical asymptotes. I know the end behavior. I'm ready to graph this thing. We can also find the y-intercept, right? I'll find mine at the end. Again, that's just something to, to confirm my graph. And then we'll talk about oblique asymptotes. So let's see if we can graph this thing. The x values I'm most interested in are x equal 1 and x equal negative 2. So we let negative 2 fall over here. Remember, that's going to be a vertical asymptote. So here's negative 2. And at x equal 1, we have a 0. So that's an actual point on my graph. So then how do we graph this? Well, we know the end behavior. That's how. So when x is large, what does large mean? Bigger than 1. What does small mean? Less than negative 2. So when x is bigger than 1, my graph has to be going up. So I just draw a graph that's going up. So it's going up here. And then I come and I intersect at x equal 1, and I have choices. I can cross over if my y value changes signs, or I can bounce and come back up if my y value keeps the same sign. Let's see. x equal 1 is 0. The multiplicity is 2. That's even. So I'm going to keep the same y values for my graph. I encounter a vertical asymptote, what are my choices? Up or down? I can't go down because I have no zeros here, so I've got to keep going up. Immediately to the right of this asymptote, my y value is positive. Immediately to the left, I will either keep the same y value or I will change y values. The vertical asymptote was at x equal to negative 2. Its multiplicity was 1. That's an odd number. So if I'm positive on the right, I must be negative on the left. And then what? Well, remember, we had three options for in behavior. I could level off somewhere. I would know if I leveled off if I saw a horizontal asymptote. I don't. So maybe I could, so my other choices would go up or go down. This thing could go up. Why not? Because it would have to cross the x-axis, and we would have a zero in there. But we don't have a zero. That's just a flake on my board. Okay? So there's no zero to cross. So we just ruled out it can't go up, and it can't level off. So what must it do? Go down which is exactly what we stated was the in behavior a while ago. And this is the graph. Not bad. Oh, you want the y-intercept? Remember to find the y-intercept. I replaced x with 0, so the y-intercept is fine. Replace x with 0. We can do that in either of these guys. We get y to 1 half, so the y-intercept is 0, 1 half. How do I indicate that on my graph? So here's our graph. This is pretty good. Now, wait a minute. I need the oblique asymptote. If I go back up here where I found the end behavior, I did that by getting rid of all the extra stuff at the ends and just said, look at the quotient of leading terms. To find the oblique asymptote, I actually need to take that ratio. That is, I need to take this guy and divide by this guy. Okay? You can do that with synthetic substitute, synthetic division, or long division. If we use synthetic division, we would take just the coefficients here. I'll do this in the different colors. So 1, negative 2, and 1. Negative 2, negative 2, and 1. Remember, if I'm using synthetic division, I'm looking for the value that makes this guy 0, dividing by x plus 2. So negative 2 goes here. First guy comes straight down 1. Multiply and add. Negative 2 times 1 is negative 2. I would use negative 4. I don't even care what comes next, but we'll see. Negative 2 times negative 4 is positive 8 plus 1 is 9. So what does that mean? That if I took this ratio, I would get x minus 4, remainder 9. That x minus 4 that's your oblique asymptote. Notice if we drew the graph of y equal x minus 4, it would be right in through here somewhere. 
So this graph would eventually get close to the function here and down there. So our graph is pretty good even without having found the oblique asymptote. But now we found it x minus four. So it would be more accurate. I would need to draw this to scale and move this whole thing down. But I'm pretty happy with our graph. And now you've seen an oblique asymptote. Can you see that? The oblique asymptote was Three examples with three different in behaviors. I hope that was helpful. So uh, shoot me an email if you have any questions. See you guys next time. As we've mentioned, students have been online only this semester, but several did come in to take the ACT and the PSAT over the last few weeks. And we were able to successfully offer socially distanced activities for those that came in the night before. Some of those options included lectures that our faculty volunteered to teach in our recital hall. The fact that so many of our faculty and students chose to be part of these shows demonstrates how important and how much everyone loves being in the classroom environment here and how much we miss those interactions between the faculty and the students that you just don't get from a virtual experience. So first, we're gonna introduce Dr. Jason Anderson who's offering a mini lesson on the emperor of all maladies taken from a lecture given to his modern genetic students each year. So thank you to Mr. Sumner back there for inviting me to do this because I guess I feel like I'm back in the classroom and this is as close as I'm going to get for right now. So hopefully, hopefully not going so, what I want to introduce to you all, some of you have a science background, some of you um, do not, but there's a topic that will touch us all, um, unfortunately, in our lives. I got introduced um, to this topic, I want to say, in 2007, and, you know, it's a phone call you'll never forget, you know, blah, 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 blah. Cute, why am I looking? What? Huh? I just talked to him earlier today. Yeah, it's 30 days ago. What? Wow, okay. And then the next question, of course, I was in graduate school then. And then my family asked, well, what is it? <laughs> uh, I don't know specifically, but I can kind of get you down the line. And that's how I kind of got introduced to cancer. And from there, I became, you know, kind of the informal doctor of the family, let my family know about this. So what I want to do for you today is kind of give you, not to scare you, but to let you know that this exists and that it's really, at its root, it's simple. Cancer is a simple, a simply, I guess, simply explainable disease, but it's so complex. I know that's such a dichotomous way of explaining it, but it really is. So I want to kind of give you, I'm going to give you a scenario to kind of paint where I want to go with this. So imagine that you're a 16-year-old teenager, and of course, what, what, what do y'all have in front of you all? Y'all have, yeah, 23 me, and y'all have all this information to know thyself, learn all about who you are, right? They, they give you all these different things. Right now, I even find out your real blood type. By the way, I'll be positive. I'm going to need you to tell me who I am. But you can find out all this information. But I mean, it's just VIP, Health and Ancestry Service. So all this information, right from there, Ancestry, learn all about yourself. That's great, fine and then, until if you're a 16 year old teenager and you do 23 and me, and I mean, man, they can give you all types of information and maybe some information you don't want to know, but they give it to you anyway. So imagine you do this test and you find out, hey, I am a carrier, or even worse, I have two mutated BRCA1 genes. You're 
You're 16 years old and all you wanted to find out was your ancestor. But you find out you have two mutated broccoli genes and you're like, what, what, what is this? Well, all of a sudden, you have what's known as the burden of knowing. That's what you're about to carry with you for the rest of your life. So I want to play, to, uh, play you a short little video kind of explaining this and then we'll kind of move on from there. So kind of put yourself in, in those shoes. I'm 20, I'm young, or I'm 15, I'm 16, and I you get all this genetic information. What do you do with it? So this, is, this happens with all inherited diseases. There's a chance that you may find out something that you may want to know, you may not want to know. And today we're going to talk about, and this is the title of a book, and great document that's called the Emperor of All Maladies. And that's what cancer is. You know, right now we're in this COVID world where COVID, 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 COVID dominates. But there's, there, there lies in a disease that kills 600,000 plus Americans every year and millions worldwide. One out of every two men, one out of every three women will get cancer. That's a reality. So it sounds more because the truth. So what does that mean? You will be affected by it somehow, some way, even directly or indirectly. So what I'm going to show you all is just kind of some root, how it happens, and kind of give you hope because I, I tell this to every genetics class I teach, more of I include, y'all will figure this out. You will. My generation, we're running out of time. Y'all will figure it out because we're getting close. So, first of all, I don't want to get into too much detail, but on its own merit, cancer itself is just unregulated cell growth, right? It's cell growth in cells that have abnormally divided and divided and divided. That's it. A normal cell went rogue. It decided, you know what? I'm going to divide when I want to divide, and I'm not going to stop. I'm just going to keep going. That's all it is. That's, that's what cancer is. The issue is how do we get there? What's kind of, what are the causes of it? This is a little complex, but we have the basic cell cycle where we go through the different phases. We have G1, S, G2, and and M. So these are the phases in which the cell gets ready to divide and then of course divides hematosis or meiosis. There are genes that control the cell cycle. That's all I want you to understand. The cell cycle can't start or stop without some genes telling it to stop or stop. That's it. So we have these things called check. And these checkpoints are critical. Every time we reach a certain checkpoint, the cell decides, hey, everything looks good, divide it, everything's growing properly, we can go to the next one. What cancer does, cancer interrupts these checkpoints at different places. And that's how it can get a cell getting cancers. That's a lot of reading. Okay, so what a cell can do to offset it? Well, a cell has a built in um, program, a built in gene that um, is called apoptosis. And basically, if the cell figures out, when the cell goes through some checks and like, wait, hold on, something's wrong. I didn't grow properly. Something happened to uh, my genetic information in the uh, synthesis. Something occurred. It's called programmed cell death. The cell will kill itself. Sounds like I'm not going to divide, I will terminate myself. Well, the issue is, is a sneaky, sneaky cancer. Cancer will, once a cell becomes cancerous, it will disrupt and uh, disable the apoptotic genes. So it's almost as if the cancer cell, a cancer is thinking, it's like, hold on, if 
there is a gene that can destroy me. Let me go ahead and disable it now so that when I'm dividing, 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 there's nothing that can stop me. So our normal cells have apoptosis. Cancer kind of disrupts that and gets rid of it. So when we're talking about genes that can cause cancer, they fall into two categories. They're either what's known as oncogenes or tumor suppressor genes. Anybody see something in common? Uncle genes, what you hear in that word? Oncology. Oncology. So, some of you may become oncologists, I don't know. Oncology is the study of cancer. So, there are genes that are called oncogenes that normally when they work, they promote cell division. They're, they're, they're good. But when they're mutated, they can cause some issues. This is obvious, right? Sometimes science just will give an obvious hint. Tumor suppressor genes. But obviously they're gonna um, they're involved in tumor suppressor, but they're also involved in other aspects of the cell. So these are two classes of genes that we have to focus on when you're trying to understand cancer. And we're gonna make this relatively painless. Okay. This gene right here. RAS. RAS is a, all this other stuff is a little complex. RAS is a gene, it's an oncogene, and its job is to stimulate cell division. That's its job. Let me show you a pathway. So here we go. This looks like it's complex, it's really not. Here's our nucleus, where our genetic information is. Here is outside of the cell, here is inside the cell, the cytoplasm. Well, there's going to be a signal from the outside that's going to tell the cell to divide. It's time for you to divide. Well, RAS activates it. So that signal gets sent. RAS says, okay, I become active now. Hey, I'm ready to do my job. It sends the signal inside the nucleus, divide. The nucleus will divide. Signal is going to come back, tell RAS, hey, I'm done dividing, and it's going to go in reverse. RAS will inactivate. Cell is good. Cell is normal. So RAS has an important function. That's what normal RAS does. Now, 
What about a tumor suppressor gene? What has to happen there? Well, with tumor suppressor genes, you have to get two mutations to get this. So you know these genes, I want to skip past this to go to the one that's relevant. You know the two genes as BRCA1 and BRCA2. That's some of the most popular tumor suppressor genes. So BRCA1 stands for breast cancer 1, breast cancer 2. So these genes are tumor suppressor genes that are often inherited and involved in um, breast and ovarian cancer. So generally what happens, you get one copy, you usually inherit one of them. And then over time, you develop something happens where you, the other gene may mutate on the other chromosome and you get, um, you have the two mutations. Now, this is important for you all to know. Um, Angelina Jolie is a great example. Angelina Jolie tested, uh, she had, oof, I want to say maybe 15 years ago, in my opinion. She has a familiar history of breast and ovarian cancer in her family. And it's, 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 I mean, it's, it's really, it has ravaged her family. So she decided to get tested. She was, she found out that she carried both mutant copies of, um, I want to say it was BRCA2. She had both of them. Did she have cancer? No. So when you, that's kind of the complex thing about it. When you find out you have two mutant variants of a, of a tumor suppressor gene, it doesn't mean you have cancer. It just means you have the genes that can promote cancer. Now, did she do like the young lady who you saw in the earlier video, she decided, I'm going to live my life. I'm going to have kids. I'm not going to let this stop. Me. Well, what happened? She developed cancer a couple of years later. Angelina Jolie did something completely not unheard of, but at that time, it was like, whoa. She decided to have a double mastectomy. And then she decided to have a hysterectomy. So she went ahead and said, all right, any tissue that's associated with this gene that can become cancerous, I'm going to remove it. You know, she had to she, she was made like at that time. That's why, again, when all this genetic information is out there, you have to be wary of, do you want to know? If you are so young, what would you do if you find out, A, if you do have familiar history of breast cancer and ovarian cancer, you might want to know, right? That's something that you have to pay attention to. But once you find out, what do you do? Do I, you know, like right now, they'll tell you a lot of pre pre preventative measures, prophylactic. You remove the tissue in question. But at 16, do you, I mean, you don't think about a hysterectomy, my guy. You don't think about having a mastectomy. But what if it saves your life? Well, listen, can you develop can, um, breast cancer at 18 or 19? Yes, I have a second cousin that had stage 3 breast cancer, survived. But I thought it was like 19 or 20. So it doesn't have like an age limit. So these are things that you have to be aware of, especially if it's in your family. So, these tumor suppressor genes, and they're on the list of, there are a lot of them, I skipped over them, but there are many, many different types of tumor suppressor genes. So, we have these tumor suppressor genes that can cause cancer, and we have these oncogenes that can cause cancer. Well, why are there a list of, and you kind of see here, there's, there's a list about 15 or so genes that are probably talked about. Because a lot of these genes, these genes here, and the um, gene we talked about before, RAS, they're commonly found in many different cancers. So it's not like, wait, hold on. If I have a mutated RAS, mutated RAS is going to give me X cancer. No, no. What 
generally happens is you get a mutated oncogene. And then when they start scanning, they start realizing, oh no, you have a mutated P53, and a mutated ROC, and a mutated RNA. All of a sudden, you start to realize you have a cascading effect. You have multiple genes that have been mutated, and then that can lead to cancer. So when you put all of this kind of in, in perspective, and I kind of want to skip to this because I, I want you to, to really take this in. And there are multiple pathways. So here's colorectal cancer. Here's prostate cancer. So two different cancers. And you see how, see this like linear path? Well, this linear path, it looks linear, but it's not. And you see in this case, you see multiple genes over time that have been inactivated, a mutated, a tumor suppressive gene here, a dominant gene here, another tumor suppressor here, another one, another one. So what happens when you have cancer? This oncogene is pretty much synonymous with a gas pedal. So if you're, at, you're driving a car and you hit the gas, well, you go, right? This RAS gene controls cell division. Hit the gas pedal, cell divides. Well, y'all don't have to worry about this in life. A long time ago, Dr. Langford kind of remembers this. Um, you, the gas pedals can get stuck in cars. <laughs> Your gas pedal can get stuck. You could be driving all of a sudden, you're like, but no, the thing's on the floor. And all of a sudden, you're speeding up. Well, when this gene is mutated, it's like a stuck gas pedal. You can't stop. You can't stop the vibe. The tumor suppressor gene is the brakes of the cell. Tumor suppressor. So when this one is, okay, you're dividing, you're dividing, this one's like, stop dividing, slow down. But again, y'all don't have to worry about this. But what if someone cut the brake lines of your car? They can't stop. You can't stop. So what happens? You speed up anyway. One is a gas pedal, one's your brakes, both needs to speeding up. Both of them will lead to unproliferated cell division. So when you look at all of this, the stage from having normal, you know, normal tissue all the way to one of the worst cancers, metastatic colorectal cancer, you see what has to happen along the way. It's not just one gene. Oh, right. there, there are five to ten to twenty. And when you see this prostate cancer, which is the deadliest cancer among um, men, you see it's multiple genes, multiple, multiple, multiple genes that are inactivated. So cancer, and what's so bad about it, every cancer is unique. Two people can have metastatic breast cancer and can have completely multiple sets of genes that are mutated, that are not the same. No one cancer is the same. So when you start thinking about that, now you may start to think, wow, oh, that's maybe why there's not a general cure for cancer because no one cancer is the same. And kind of to put it into perspective, I know you can't see this. I just wanted to throw this out there. For you all in engineering who loves engineering, what does this look like? A circuit. This looks like a circuit. A very complex circuit. You know what this is? This, these are just pathways to cancer. This is just one. These are multiple pathways with a couple of genes, you see those genes in the center? They kind of branch off. Those are the rasses, those are the broncos, those are the ones that control other genes. This is how we have to attack cancer. There are multiple pathways there, and everyone has their own unique pathway. Every 
cancer is unique to an individual. So how do we beat this? Right now, some of the biggest issues, biggest therapies or the most important therapies are targeted gene therapy. And those gene therapies are focusing on your immune system. Teaching your own immune system to recognize, wait, something in the body's going wrong and for it to attack. It's called immunotherapy. The future of cancer therapy is bright. The days of chemotherapy, everyone get the same chemotherapy, is over. Because that doesn't work. But hey, if I can figure out if uh, Dr. Langford and myself, we both go in with uh, early stage uh, pancreatic cancer, not COVID, 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 never. And they say, well, Dr. Langford, we will treat you with this radio analog, and we'll treat you this way, this way, this way, based upon your cancer. And Dr. J, we'll treat you this way. And we're going to use your own immune systems to try to help recognize um, the cancer that you have. So what studies are showing us is that our immune system, when cancer strikes, a lot of times, our immune systems don't recognize it as being foreign. So if we can teach our own immune system to recognize the cancer of the cells without harming the normal cells, then we have a better outlook on things. So kind of in, in summary, what I want you to take away from this is cancer is complex and it's simple. It's very simple in the way uh, it forms. It's complex in its underlying tale. As you kind of peel back the onion, you start realizing, oh, there's something else. You peel it back again, there's something else. But detection will be the key. For you all who, um, you know, I, I talked about the burden of knowing, but if you understand, if you have a familiar history of cancer in your family, you might want to start early with detection. Because even though it sounds barbaric, we can do something about breast cancer, right? There are insurance companies that if there's a familiar history of breast cancer in your family, they will pay for all the tests. They will pay for treatment. Because they know if you take care of this now and then or not wait 10, 15, 20 years, then it's going to be more costly. So early detection is the key. And from there, just pay attention. I mean, cancer has no age range. It has no ethnicity preference. It, it doesn't care. It does not care. It's, it's the emperor of all maladies for a reason. It, um, it's been here since the dawn of time, and there is actually some evidence. You look at some hieroglyphics, you like they were drawing about cancer. It's been here. So we can do something about it. Your generation can do something about it, but you can't stop. Y'all can't stop. Um, if you've been afflicted by it, you know what it can do. It's, I mean, it, it, it ravages families. Um, it can tear families apart. So I, I just encourage you all to, again, stay, um, don't let it, you know, dominate your life. Don't let it um, act like, you know, there's nothing we can do about it. We can fight. And if you notice any, you know, you know, we're coming up, you know, we're in breast cancer awareness, but if you notice any um, support videos, or if you see any of them, they always will say, fight, fight, fight. Cancer, when you're battling cancer, it's a fight. And, and it's, it's, it's ironic, they gave my grandfather 30 days to live, and he actually lived 30 days, and never lost a hand at all. So um, hopefully you um, learn a little bit about this. If you have any questions, I kind of finish with about 20 some minutes. If you have any questions, please let me know. That's the problem.
We don't. We have no idea why a child was born with retina blastoma. <laughs> Well, I mean, there are cancer causing agents, right? So we know tobacco smoking and, and smoking cigarettes cause cancer. We know UV exposure causes cancer. We know exposure to this poison or that poison can cause cancer, right? The big thing right now, what the big wild up loss, right? Huge. But outside of this area, it's like, we don't, I could go to, I could go in and get checked up tomorrow. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, stage one prostate cancer. Like, oh, I feel fine. Don't know. That's our issue. If we could predict it, that's why they have screenings. That's why when you get a certain age, there are screenings for this. You get a certain age, age that we recommend you have a mastectomy. A mammogram every year. We suggest you do this. You have a prostate um, exam, have a PSA exam when you hit 40, when you hit 45. They're just benchmarks. We know that cancers are more prevalent as you get older. You start getting around 50, 55, you start to see the prevalence of cancer go up, but we don't know, sir. It, it, it's, it's sporadic, random, inherited. It, it, it's strange. You can inherit cancer. You can, it can be caused from UV to chemicals. We don't know. We don't know. We, there have been identical twins who have the same genetic information. One gets cancer, one doesn't. That lets you know that our Yes. Um, do you know about, like, uh, you probably do, but the paradox of the nature of larger organisms being less prone to cancer than smaller organisms? Yeah, I just wanted to know if you knew anything about Yeah, I mean, but we've seen, I mean, there are plants that get tumors. <laughs> but, but why do you think that larger organisms are more more cells. than like us? More cells. I mean, you have more cells. The more cells you have, the more prone you are to cancer. No, they are less prone to cancer. What are you talking about? Like, well, it depends how much they divide. So, I mean, our cells are typically actively divided. And the only cells that are not divided are nerve cells, heart cells, and others. Everything else is they're actively actively divided. Now why? I mean there there are cases of you know feline cancer, there are cases of I don't hear too much about larger larger mammals in that case. I'm sure it happens. It's just the fact I don't know how widely studied it is versus um humans, and the fact that we, again, our cells are so, we got so many cells that are so actively divided more, they're actively divided, and we live longer in a lot of cases. Um, the more you're prone to errors, that's always the case. Mitosis, things will go wrong the longer you live. It's rare that you, you find someone 70, 80, 90 years old with nothing, you know, wrong. So as the longer you live, the longer you know, your cells are still dividing, they're gonna make mistakes over time. And that's when you see it. So you see more cancer, so think about it. You know, outside of elephants and some other mammals, we, we live a long time. More of the cancers are more prevalent later in life. So if you have something that's, you may be a large animal, but they live 20, 30 years, yeah, they might not get cancer. Yeah, like elephants and blue whales are significantly less prone to cancer than us. Even and they live long, yeah, but then uh, it's called it's called fetal. Yeah, yeah. they don't they don't have a concrete answer for why. You know, they don't. don't know. I don't know. We need to steal something from them. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, they got something going on. Nature. Any other questions, comments, Josh? Are you gonna ever do this? Has it anything to do with like the fact that you see? Yeah, but I mean, it's, so the paradox of that is even, okay, why are we living longer, but we have more maladies out there? So I'll give you an example. So my grandparents both, they lived to the mid 80s. They ate hard, to me, they ate hardly. 
in terms of they fried things in Greece, they did this, they did that. that they, they had nothing wrong. My grandfather didn't have anything wrong with him until he got punched at 85. Right, right? I mean, he didn't have any other homework on arthritis and this and that. No. But so think about it now, even though it seems like we're eating better in terms of diets and stuff, we have many, many more issues that are more prevalent now than they were, say, you know, two, three, four generations ago. So I don't know. Yeah, that, that's weird, Josh, because of the fact we are living longer. We still have, you know, we, we have better science that's allowing us to live longer, yet we have more things that we're living with. That's the issue. I mean, as soon as you get sick with anything, you're ready to put you on some medication for anything. Just from the studies, from the lab studies. It's just been shown that the study about tobacco and cigarettes, that was a study done a long time ago, where they just saw the prevalence, epidemiologists recognized the, whoa, wait, hold on, the people who smoke, the incidence of cancer did that, they kind of tied them together. It's just the chemicals. We just know that there are certain cancer causing chemicals in, in rats and the different things that cause it. So we know it's prevalent with us as well. It doesn't mean you're going to get it though. That's the weird thing. I have, a, I have relatives that have smoked all their lives. They're in their seventies. They're fine. They have the smoker's voice, cough, everything. No cancer. And I know people have died and never smoked a day in their life from lung cancer. All right, y'all. Thank y'all for being my audience. Thank you, Mr. Summer, for this. Y'all have a good one. Thank y'all. Dr. Anderson, I really appreciate you and your students for allowing those who are with us today for Exploration Day to get a taste of what actually happens in a Louisiana school classroom. And the students ask some phenomenal questions because cancer research is an important study for everyone because I think all of us have been affected by it in one way or another. But now we're going to listen to Dr. Kelly Langford, who's going to share a presentation she uses in two of her elective history courses, World War I and Women's History. Dr. Langford. What I'm going to do today is introduce you to um, Anna Coleman Ladd, who was an American sculptor who did this sort of incredible thing during the war that got her a whole lot of attention. But then I think her story is important beyond that. She's been a sort of a research project of mine, and I'm trying to kind of build it up into more. Her, her work in the war affected her sculpting work after the war, and she created different war memorials than most people did. Americans had this sort of schizophrenic way of memorializing World War I, <clears throat> and her facial mask work really affected her, her presentation of how we should consider that war. And so that's the story I want to tell you. Um, so before, so what you need to know is um, World War One is terrible and tragic, and I have this weird attraction to it. And I just find it fascinating on every level, mainly because I, I will never understand how people who survived even a little bit of what you're about to see, then 20 years later, while they were older adults, lived through it again as World War II. I don't know how anybody came out of this intact in body, if not in mind, and, and then saw it happen again. <laughs> So in order for me to explain Anna's work to you, I, I don't really need for you to understand World War One. Those of you who are in the World War One class will know a lot more, but Americans grow up knowing a lot more about World War Two than World War One, sad to say. It's a terrible, it's a terrible oversight of the education system. But uh, World War One happened between 1914 and 1918. It's literally a world war, except not so much Asia. And it's fought in France and 
in the western part of Russia. So Americans, when they showed up, we got involved very late in the war. We Americans declared war on Germany in 1917 and spent 1918 basically making the Germans collapse. We 100% helped end this war, completely rather that we were there. But mainly I wanted you to just sort of see what these guys deal with. This is um, mostly trench warfare, especially in the western part where the Americans ended up. And so what happens is this, uh, this is industrial warfare on a scale that the world had never seen before. Almost all of the main countries uh, were industrialized so they could produce innumerable ways of killing people at great scale and very quickly. And so the millions of dead in four years just had never been conceived of in wartime before. And this is what it looks like. They, these men are in trenches, and when, that, so they endure shell fire attacks, which they can't control, and they just sit there and try to live through it. And then somebody blows a whistle, and they have to go over the top, meaning crawl up out of the trench and go over the top. And then in that one, how do you make the little, uh, they run across no man's land. <laughs> which is uh, the area between your trench and the end of the trench. So you run across this mud pit, mud, middle drown in the mud. You run across the mud pit, usually while you're facing machine gun fire on the other side. And then you're supposed to jump in their trenches, kill all their guys, and then you want that much time. That over and over and over again. So this is what it looks like. They endure these horrible, moments where you have days and weeks where you're doing nothing, you're bored out of your mind, but you're enduring shell fire. You can't move up the train until the snipers will see you. Rats the size of dogs, lives that drive them crazy. And then there'll be an attack and you have to run across no man's land and you and your friends are probably going to get wounded or you're going to die. Um, it's also the chemist war. They escalate the number of the terrible gases that they use all through the war. So the gas mass become part of the living in World War One. So this is what it looks like. These are some of the big guns that they use. So you can imagine when those shells land, they create house-sized craters in the ground. Um, and they just, they can fire so many of these, <laughs> it boggles the mind. And so it's just industrialized, horrific killing fields. Uh, after World War I. Um, here's another one. It, World War I sort of looks the same no matter whose uniform you have looking at. With the men, with the barbed wire, the empty landscape, everything has been shelled to oblivion. Um, and, you know, the, the men start to look like they've seen some things. No, nobody really gets out of this unscathed. Um, and here's another one. This is, you can see this guy sitting in a trench. The trenches are pretty awful. They just want you to gather there until you go over the top. They don't want, they don't mostly want you to be very comfortable. So he's hiding in these little, they're like little hiding holes in the trench. And so if the other side is shelling you, you can't get up and leave because the snipers will shoot you, see you and shoot you. So you just have to sit there. It's hard to land an artillery shell flying off. They can't aim them, but all it has to do is hit somewhere here or here or here, and you're buried alive. So this this guy is is suffering from shell shock. That's the famous thousand yard stare, the dead man stare, where they just cannot focus on something in front of him. I mean, the men start to experience pretty awful what they call shell shock, which is slightly different from PTSD, but it's it's its cousin. So this is the kind of thing that these men are enduring. The landscape is dead too. There are no trees. There are no flowers. There are no bushes. It's a mud pit. This guy is standing on a pile of empty shells that were used in the first few days of one of the worst battles of the war. And that's just one pile. There are others where he's standing on a hill of used shells. So this is what it looks like. Um, so, jarring, <laughs> jarring switch. 
Um, this is what Anna Coleman Ladd is reckoned with when she does her work. So when the war began, she's living in Boston with her husband, and he's a doctor, they've got two daughters. She's a sculptor, and she makes um, garden statues and fountains, and sometimes a wealthy family will say, hey, we want a bust done of Grandpa, and she'll do that. She's not an Indian, you haven't come across, she's not famous. But as a young woman, she had studied in France, and she was fluent in French. And so, um, in 1917, sorry, I'm just my class. In 1917, when the United States declared war, um, an artist friend of hers who remembered that her bust of faces tended to be very, very detailed, wrote to her and said, hey, you're an artist, you should come use your artwork to help these soldiers. Um, they had started a similar artist unit in London, and he told her about it, and she spoke French, and that's where all the soldiers are. And so she followed, her husband had already left for the war. He was setting up pedi pediatric hospitals in France through the Red Cross. So she left the kids with the grandparents, went with the Red Cross, and she set up um, her, let me get the name of her studio right. Um, the studio for portrait masks in Paris. And this is the kind of work that she did. So it's a little bit weird. The, the, the four pictures in each case are on the right, and the after photos are on the left. She made facial masks, masks for men who had been terribly disfigured in the war. Um, these men had already undergone facial reconstruction surgery, and this was the best it was going to get. A lot of these men are men who would probably not have survived in previous wars. Um, they probably would have died of infection when somebody tried to operate on their faces, but now there's good enough medicine and antibiotics that they're surviving. And so the problem is, because nobody's used to seeing men with such disfigured faces, and certainly not the huge numbers of them. I mean, every country is enacting a draft. Millions of men are serving. They're coming back with terrible wounds. Nobody's used to seeing this. So when these men walk around in public, people scream in their faces, children cry, people curse at them because they're so scared. So they hole up, they can't get a job, they can't date, it's mortifying. And so going to this studio to have a mask made is life changing for them. And that's what she does. So you can see like this is the mask. Now if you saw this guy walking down the street, you might still do a double take but you probably would scream in his face. I mean, it was so severe. When these men were recovering at the reconstruction hospitals, they would paint the benches outside of the hospitals bright blue so that the public knew, don't look at those men if they're sitting on a blue bench because they'll upset you, which you can imagine how that makes the men feel. So <clears throat> something like this could really affect their entire future. So I'm going to show you a brief video to fix it out of this. So that's the work that she did. Um, I'll go to the next one. Here's another guy. You can see see what a difference it makes to have it. Um, I mean, you really, if you're looking at them really quickly too, you might not notice some of the guys. They wouldn't eat in front of their families because they were missing their jaws and they were, they were really embarrassed. And so this just, they can live normal lives with the masks. Um, here's the mask. I would, I would sell my soul to have one of these masks, but I can't find them anywhere. And I think it's for two reasons. Because they're so thin, I think as the men wore them, they got kind of deemed and beat up and that over the years they probably had to have them remade by another local artist. Or, my other theory is, they were very different. Um, while Anna was there, the, the, the studio made about 93 masks. Almost all of them soldiers, almost all of them French. There were two women who were wounded with liquid fire, which is when you just 
put gasoline down the hose and light it on fire and try to kill people. So they did help two women, but mostly it's the French soldiers. And then when the war ended, Anna went back home and the portrait made about another hundred masks. It doesn't come close to the need uh, of the numbers of men who did, but for the men who died, it was everything. So it's a really unusual way to serve in the war, uh, to be an artist and to turn your skills you know, to making masks like this. It's really fascinating. She, got, she had a lot of newspapers that wrote about her, um, got a lot of press because most women who worked in the war were, were volunteers for the Red Cross. Like they drove the ambulances or um, they um, served as sort of amateur nurses. So this was really kind of extraordinary just by itself. And that's how I first came across her. I read about her facial mask work and I thought, gosh, that's amazing. But then I had a chance to read, to go to the archives of American art, which is the Smithsonian Museum, and I read all of her stuff and I realized some of the work that she did after the war was equally as interesting, I thought. Well, but here's another guy. So I, I mean, I <laughs> could. I just find the transformation to be sort of incredible for these men. Um, there's another one. She, she did get thank you letters. There, one of my favorites was the wife of one of them wrote and said, thank you, thank you for the mask, but he had such beautiful deep brown eyes and this eye color is so light. Could you change it? And I think she must have sent the mask and Anna changed it because the letter I saw was a thank you letter for her changing the eye color. Um, that's her studio. I mean, if you just walked in and saw that with no context, you might, might be a little put off, but you know, <laughs> what the work they're doing is, is sort of amazing. So, um, when the war ended and she came back home, so did her husband, she started her studio work again, making fountains and statues and uh, garden, garden things, um, lots of birds. <laughs> And there started to be some artists who were memorializing World War I in particular ways, and nobody got more attention than this guy. He's a self-taught artist, Ernest McKeesney, who created the spirit of the American Doughboy, which he said was very Americanist and authentic. And you can see, it's a very proud image, right? The, the American soldiers were referred to as Doughboys, Nobody really knows why, but we were called <laughs> And so, you know, this is like, yes, we did it. We won the war. It's all good. War, war was worth it. Uh, then they made lamps from the American Doughboy. <laughs> he sold over 300 of these, 300 of these to various states and cities. Um, every, and that's how most people were memorializing the war, you know. Yes. Which, of course, makes sense. Um, but it became so common, the spirit of the American Doe Boy, and he really promoted himself. I mean, he was everywhere talking about how Americanist it was and authentic. I don't know what that means in terms of memorial, but that was the word that he kept using. Um, and it got so upsetting that one of the big arts commissions in the country put out a call for other artists to come up with other ways to memorialize World War I. Um, here's another one. This man is not, also not famous, but he was a friend of Anna's, kind of a mentor, friend, fellow artist. And he produced this piece called War, which was basically a bust of the great German general Paul von Hindenburg. You probably know the name Hindenburg from the dirigible that flew over New Jersey and burst into flame in 1937. Everything in Germany and France is named for World War I guys in the 20s and 30s. So. But what I find sort of funny, funny like that, off about this is the art critic who was trying to get the public to come look at this said, well, if you're a pacifist, you'll look at this and be reminded of the heredity of war. But if you're a militarist and you feel like war is good, you'll feel like, yes, this is one of the young bulls of, of military leadership. Which means that you're invited to look at this 
And if you're a pacifist or a gung-ho militarist, you can find your message in a bus of one guy, which means there's no message there. If everybody can find something there, then does it really say anything in general? So I think it is, this is my theory, <laughs> that things like this started to kind of break on Anna. Now, when she first got home, she did do a few World War I pieces that were of this thing. This is her, Doughboy, Armistice Day, and General Pershing. So the Doughboy is obvious. Armistice Day is celebrating uh, what happened at 11 a.m. on the 11th day of the 11th month when the guns went silent and the war ended. You now call that Veterans Day, but it was Armistice Day then. And then Pershing is the guy who led the entire American army. If you look at them up close, they don't all look identical. They do look like different gods, but it's still the sort of, you're, you're clearly meant to say, ah, oh, Pershing, yes, he's a god. You know, feel proud. So it's a little bit along that name. She also got commissioned to do this work by a local family for their their personal soldier who died, and then she sort of extended it on the flag to include some other local soldiers. And that one makes him look sort of half civilian, half soldier, kind of a little bit more realistic, but still, there's no big message there, right? It's clearly a memorial to this guy. But this one is different. Now you have to kind of let your eyes adjust when you first look at it. You think, what am I looking at? <laughs> um, this is the piece that she called Peace. She actually called it Peace, um, peace Controlling War. Because that's Peace Controlling War. He's killing somebody. Um, and to me, this is the switch that starts to happen for her. In 1921, 22, she started to produce some pieces like this, where she is clearly trying to explain, you have to consider what happened to the actual soldiers. And of course, I believe this came straight out of her being around these soldiers, the, the time that it took to create those masks. You saw her, she's touching them, she's talking to them, she's asking them, about their past, what their face used to look like, do you have any photos? She got to know them. And she was in France, she knew how awful it was. And so her memorial work starts to look a little bit different. Um, and definitely has a message. This is not, war is good. She actually explained, she has a pretty amazing way of explaining this one. She says, um, and when I got back from the mud and blood around her dying, Verdun is one of the most famous battles of the whole war. It's a little bit of a lie. She's not after that. But she knew that people would recognize the name. <laughs> so she said, when I got back from the mud and blood around Verdun, from scenes of inconceivable heroism and horror, I dared to make war memorials with victory as a worn and tragic figure, not a complacent woman waving a wreath. The men who had been there felt it was the real thing. I have told committees I would give up the commission rather than go against my conviction. <clears throat> so she was very, she felt very strongly about it. This is, I, I really like this one too. Um, this is in a cemetery outside of Boston. And this is a close up view of what you see. It's pretty tall. I, when I walked up to this, my head came up to about here, and then that was several feet taller, so it's pretty tall. And this is winged victory, and that's the cost of victory. It's really obvious, right? <laughs> I don't have to explain it. You understand the point she's trying to make there. So she clearly was getting commissioned to make some local pieces like this in the, in the Boston area. She never really did break into national attention. But this is not like the usual World War I memorial. She did get a little bit fascinated with um, the masculine Christianity movement, and I mention it only for one reason. This had actually been something that was popular before the war. She's late to it. But she really went out on a limb and defended the way that she portrayed Christ. She called these her Christ figures. 
for obvious reasons. <laughs> and she said that this is what the youth wanted, that um, sort of a soft Christ with greenlets in his hair is not representative. It's, it's, he, she called it effeminate. She said, this is what the youth want. And, I, and for one reason I find that important, she clearly felt like she knew what these young men had experienced and the kinds of images they wanted to see because of her experience there. I don't think there's much more to be made of these particular images. That movement had passed her by. But this is the one that I find um, the most incredible. I had seen so many pictures of this when I was looking at her research. I thought it was huge. I thought it was like wall size. It's, it, it's like this big. <laughs> this, this is a bronze. But you can rub it flat. It's right up against a big granite um, disc sitting in the middle of another cemetery. The American Legion asked her to do this. The American Legion is a service organization that honors veterans of World War I. Now it honors all veterans. And they wanted something that represented the truth of war. So she did this. On one side of the granite, disc, for lack of a better word. It's like a stone, really. The, the, the granite stone is night, and on the other side is dawn. And this side, you can see what it is. It's a skeleton, really. It's not even a, a man. It's a skeleton caught in barbed wire, standing on other, it, it looks like other dead bodies, you know, and sort of death and destruction, and it's very dark. And the American Legion was really excited. They said, this is it. This is what we wanted. We wanted people to understand what the soldiers went through. And so that, that to her is what it was. And then the other side is Dawn. And this one, she still has, you know, there are some signs of wartime suffering. He looks like maybe he's wounded and he's reaching up. This guy looks like he's maybe somehow crawling out of a trench. I don't know what's happening here, something bad. But this is industrial progress and fraternity in the middle. And you can see the sun rising behind them as dawn. And again, the American Legion said, yes, yes, if we can't believe that this is the outcome, that we have fraternity and that we have industrial progress, not, you know, not destruction, then, then all the sacrifice was for nothing. And they had a big parade and the unveiling. She was a little afraid there would be protests because uh, this one especially was so dark. There's a little bit of chatter in the editorials in the paper, but otherwise everybody seemed satisfied with it. And it just, she really wasn't doing what most Americanists were doing in the way that they represented um, World War I. So I think she's pretty exceptional. It was, it was unusual for a woman artist to get commissions anyway. And, and her experience with the men and making the masks changed the kind of artwork that she did. She wasn't doing the garden statues for a while. She was doing this. And she gave a speech where she gave her big idea. When victory had been bought at such a cost of anguish, exhaustion, insomnia, ugliness, and horror, it is hardly the time for the placid meeting of moral crowns as in more sentimental days. The victors can sit back no longer. They are bound by that sacrifice of boys to live up to their ideal of a new world, to make good their hopes, to remember that is the message of the war memorial. <clears throat> remember, not only the war that cost our whole world its youth, but that building service to country and mankind, which alone <clears throat> makes the nation great. So she was pretty passionate about it. Um, I think Night and Dawn were her biggest claims to fame in the local community. Um, but two years ago, because I got brown fund money to go on a World War I battlefield tour in France, it was a trip of a lifetime, I found her studio after the tour was over. I had two days to myself in Paris. <laughs> and um, I found it. And I stood on the street and cried for about an hour, and then I kind of alarmed the people 
that lived there. It's not a studio anymore. It's a and it's an apartment complex. I think it was mostly immigrant families who were walking in and out. And I was like, oh my god, I'm going. <laughs> and it's a couple hundred photos. But if you remember from the video, that's the gate. So there's no fire or anything. There's no art because nobody knows the work that she did or the others did. But um, this is the work of Anne Coleman Ladd and how Americans are trying to memorialize World War One. Um, I, I, since I had read her records, I knew the address of the studio, and I just walked there. It was way further away than I thought, <laughs> but it was really worth it. Any other questions? Did the veterans have to, like, pay for their masks, or what was it, like, It was provided for them. The, the Red Cross paid for everything. The, the masks themselves are just thin metal and wire. Um, and then they painted them with enamel paints, and I think that made it a little stronger. Yeah. You think they were called go boys because they were like really quiet? Or really... The, the opinions vary. Some people said that one of the first groups that got over there was from New Mexico, and they had been in a bakery. So they got it. It seems unlikely to me that you would sail across the Atlantic and still have bakery dough on your person. <laughs> so I think that's more likely it. They got sent over with very minimal training, and I think to the hardened French and English there, they just seemed kind of pasty and you know whatever. Just go. We're done. Go. Please go fight. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. It's really exciting to see the interactions that took place between Dr. Langford and her students on a topic that you just really wouldn't hear a lot about in a regular high school classroom. We do that all the time here. Our, our classroom discussions are entertaining, they're informative. People just walk into them because they're interested in hearing more about something that they've never thought about before. And I can assure you, many of us have never thought about those topics at all. So we, again, Dr. Langford, she's one of those that loves to explore new things. And she loves to share that enthusiasm with her students. You'll get that here at the Louisiana School. But now I'm gonna introduce Dr. Morris Tishner, and yes, it's Dr. Tishner, and he's giving you a really fascinating presentation specifically for our students ahead of the PSAT that the students took last week. Welcome, Dr. Tishner, and enjoy. Hey guys, welcome. Y'all are all here because you're taking the PSAT tomorrow. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we're also using this opportunity to, to entertain you with, with some extra lectures. And using that same opportunity to uh, give this as a sort of model exploration day to people who, who aren't able to come visit campus, like, like some of y'all did when you were prospective students. So this is going to be half PSAT prep for you guys, half also just random stuff that I'm just going to tell you about. So we're going to do PSAT math without calculator portion. Uh, I stole it from the PSAT practice exams, except I replaced the numbers with, with ancient Greek and Roman numerals. It's, it's going to be amazing. You're going to have a great time. Okay, uh, so what we're going to talk about today, uh, Arabic numerals, where do our numbers come from? The numbers that you use that you're going to see on the test tomorrow. We're going to talk about different numeral systems that were used in ancient Greece. Learn what those look like. Uh, we're going to uh, review Roman numerals, which I know everyone generally has learned at some point in their life, uh, but maybe they don't remember the big numbers. Uh, but we'll review those, and then we'll also see where those numbers came from, and do some, some weirder things that you don't normally like with Roman numerals. And at the end, we're gonna, I'm going to give you your PSAT questions to, to try. I'll only give you a couple. Okay. okay. So, where do our numbers come from? These, these words that we know. So, when I ask numbers, 
I'm going to try to do two things. So, number one, where do the words come from? Zero, one, two, three, four, five. Where do we get those things? How did they get to us? And then also, the numerals, these, these little symbols that we use to represent each of the numbers. Where did those come from? So, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to open up. Who wants to give the question and answer to either one of those? So what do we call our numerals? Integers. Integers, that's a good one, yeah. Digits. Those are all good answers. So integer just means, it's from a Latin word, whole, W-H-O-L-E. It just means a whole number, right? Digit uh, is, is the Latin word for a finger. So that, that's all you're doing is going to want to, for how many digits you are holding up. So we call the ones that the Romans used Roman numerals. What do we call our numerals? Numbers? Yes, you're right. <laughs> Arabic numerals. Uh, yeah, okay. I heard, heard that at some point. I'm going to practice it. All right, very good. How about, how about our words that we have? We, we just learned them when we were kids, but, but where does English come from? It is, it is, it's a Germanic language, very nice. So it comes from this whole group of languages uh, that we call Germanic uh, family. Um, those we, our linguists have been able to reconstruct and go backwards in time, figure out uh, what those languages may have originally kind of sounded like. We don't, it's all just sound laws and made it up. It's complete, just utter nonsense. But, they came up with some rules, and so we think we know what some of these words look like way back when. So, our language that we speak is modern English. Before that, there was Middle English. And before that, there was Old English. Which is, which is the fun stuff that we're going to look at here and see where, where some of these come from. So, skipping on. Okay, so the number one comes from the Old English word, um, which, which looks like what other English word? And, yeah, exactly. So our indefinite article and that we use for a uh, and and uh, is exactly the same word as one. It just went through some different shifts uh, in its sounds. This came from the Proto-Germanic word we think. Any of the asterisks means it's completely made up. Uh, we, haven't, we have no actual reading evidence for this. Um, but we've been able to reproduce uh, something called Inez. And from that, there are, there's a bigger family. Uh, combines Germanic, um, Indo-Iranian Indo uh, language groups, several other language groups, uh, something that's called Proto-Indo-European. It's the source for Latin, Greek, and therefore from Latin, most of the European languages, uh, a lot of the Indian languages. Uh, word that, that oh, the, the furthest back we can go from one is something called Poinus. So this would be the root for, how about Spanish? What is Spanish for? Uh -huh. Uno, nice. And, and French? Uh -huh. Very nice. And German? Uh -huh. I very nice. They're all hidden right there. Eins is, is hidden right there. Uh, un, is, is from this oin, it goes through Latin, unus, to, and then you just drop off the plus ending. All right, two. How do we pronounce that? Let's try. Toi. Oh, very nice. Uh, although that sounds like three in French. Yeah. In Old English, we do toi. Uh, so we get words like twain. Have you ever heard that? I only know it from Robin Hood. Like he shoots the arrow and he shoots one arrow to the other and it splits Robin's arrow in twain. I don't know, that's from the Disney movie. Um, from, from there, we can go back to her different duo. Which, let, let's, let's try our other one. French. Good, oh, look at that. How about German? Oh, how does that work? I guess there's got to be someone playing with twi right there, right? I know, sorry. Okay, Spanish. Very good. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Uh, three. What is this? 
Have we ever seen this little guy? It's a letter that doesn't exist anymore. It's amazing here. So, this one has anyone ever heard of something called the food fork? Oh, yeah. So, prior to Old English using the Latin alphabet, they had something called the runic alphabet. And you take the first five letters. Which one are the four. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, yeah, first six letters of the alphabet. Uh, and it comes up with what we call the runic alphabet, the food work. Um, and the third one of these is, is this TH thing. This was its own letter. It's called Thorn. We also have another one that did TH. So it's the TH sound. That one also did TH sound. We needed two TH sounds in English for some reason. Uh, oh, there's this thing. Have we seen that? Have we seen any fancy encyclopedias? Encyclopedia. So yeah, this is that. This is what's called the ash. There's wind. This is sort of W sound. Uh, that one drops off further. But this thorn, it is fun because it was how we spelled the word V. And eventually this was just using enough signs. Uh, and when we spelled stuff back in the day, we would add extra vowels like oldie, ye oldie, shaka. Right? So this is the thing. People got confused with the spelling there, and that's how we ended up with this anachronistic Y in ye oldie. But this is going to end up turning into three up there from perfect genetic trees per uh, European traits that uh, the T just. Aspirates a bit there. Okay, four is Pior, uh, Pro Germanic Fid War, and uh, Pro Indo European Quit War. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I can't really pronounce it very well. Uh, because they're, they're not real languages. Uh, and then we have, um, they, they basically follow the same pattern of Old English, Proto Germanic, Proto Indo European. Ten is falling because it's ten, ten, decum, and then when we get to eleven and twelve, and this is what's fun about English, our counting system is weird. Let me get that. So how do we? Oh, we know how to do it. We're going to do eleven and twelve. And why is that one teen and two teen? Have we thought about that? I would want ten, one teen, two teen, three teen, or thirteen, fourteen, fifteen to make sense. But this 11 is two separate words, end laufen from uh, Pro Germanic Einelit. Uh, so this is an from this Einus word. It's just one left. So we count to 10 and we have one left. And that's what 11 is. 12 is just toile, so two left. So we're right here. This doesn't actually go back to uh, Pro Europe. And for the European because um, that counting system wasn't universal. Zero, however, has a completely different thing. Did we get to this in that class? Did anyone learn about zero in math? Zero is a weird number because it was for a while it wasn't a number. Zero from French zero, uh, Italian zero, uh, comes from the middle Latin, medieval Latin. Zephyrum, which comes from Arabic, cipher, cipher. That's where we get the word cipher. It just means a nothingness. Uh, and that, in turn, comes from Sanskrit, void or nothingness. And those words are so called because it comes from Arabic, from, uh, from Sanskrit, because that's where that numeral came from. For the longest time, and when you've learned Roman numerals, there is no zero here, because there was no zero back then. It wasn't until the seventh century uh, that the number zero was actually theorized. And 
this has to do with the way numbers are written. Our numbers, uh, we can trace back the actual forms pretty far into like the third century uh, BC uh, to the Brahmi uh, numerals there. They, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, there's no actual ten. It's because there, or there was no zero idea. There is a separate number for ten, just like there's a separate number for ten in uh, Roman numerals, uh, but there's no actual zero or place number system. This idea of a place system, of having a tens place and a hundreds place and a thousands place that we take for granted, is it was super new uh, as far as number systems happen. Uh, it wasn't until basically right around the time that uh, uh, Brahmaguta was theorizing the zero flip that we ended up getting uh, the idea of tens place, hundreds place, etc. And that's the big thing, the big discovery, the different way of writing things that allowed us to do all the hard math that uh, y'all are going to be tested on tomorrow. So the uh, alphabets we can see the, the, the Hindu alphabet, this is from uh, the city of Gwalior. Um, goes to one, two, three, four, five. That looks like four to me, but it's five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then they have this pumped, this sort of zero, this dot. That's going to be the zero. It's just a little placeholder that they have for a while. The big thing that happens, and why it didn't just uh, stay, um, uh, or how it spread from India and got to eventually uh, these random old English people that, that are hanging out uh, in far island in uh, Europe is that uh, the Hindu uh, numeral system was translated into Arabic by these two mathematicians. Uh, al Khwarizmi, uh, that's a type of Japanese writer, and Al Kindi. So they wrote two different works, and these, these are the cool names of them. Um, Al Khwarizmi uh, wrote, uh, well, I'm not going to read that there because I, I don't actually know how to pronounce it, but the Algoritmo, uh, sorry, Algoritmi de Numero in uh, That's the, the way it was translated from Arabic into Latin and therefore entered Europe uh, as that title. And that's because they could not spell his name, just like I accidentally misspelled the name right there. Uh, it was spelled in Latin, Algoritmi. Uh, which is where we ended up getting the word algorithm. Yes. Uh, he also wrote a book um, that was translated into uh, Latin as uh, Liber Algebrae at uh, uh, al uh, This is the compendious book on calculation by completion and balancing. This has uh, that, that word that we uh, have to take, uh, I think, right? right? Liber Algebrae, Algebra. Uh, so that's literally just the word for balancing, for moving things from one side to an, of one equation to another. So through different translations, uh, it ends up being spread through Northern Africa. Um, this is going to be the letter forms that were taught in Northern Africa through Spain, the, the Western Arabic, uh, what's called the um, the, the Gubar writing system. This is uh, it's called ghost letters because uh, when calculations were made, they were written on something called uh, dust boards. So you have a board and you just trace uh, the letters into the dust and you can wipe it free at the end. These were the letter forms used for that. Uh, the same uh, letters through. Uh, uh, Hindi goes into uh, Eastern Arabic, uh, the Sanskrit and uh, the Dhanagari uh, numerals come exactly from the same place. When we get to the, uh, the Western Arabic different letter forms, that's, uh, they get brought into Europe like three different ways, at least. Um, so in the, I'd say 10th century, but it's here, so the 11th century, uh, it's, it's right at the time. Uh, this guy called Gerbert Alrelic, or sorry, Alrelic, uh, brought it in. He was later Pope Sylvester II, but he was totally interested in all these different number theories. Uh, he wrote something called the Apexes, we could, we could call it that. Um, this is the Latin plural of the word apex, apex. 
And what he had was he had these little tokens that you would put on different tables to um, show the different placeholders for the, the one system, or the, sorry, the, the one's place, the tens place, the hundreds place, and the thousands place. What he didn't actually have was zero. What he would use was instead of he would just not put a little token holding one of those um, nine letter forms in there. The person that actually ended up bringing it into uh, and popularizing it in Europe was this guy called Fibonacci. So, have we heard that name? Yeah. What, what did he do? Yeah, the Fibonacci number is the Fibonacci sequence. And we've seen that written down with the boop, 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 and just make the giant number. Yeah. So, uh, I think very, very interested in this right idea. He wrote something called the Leader of Baki. So, for those who have taken, I see a couple left in this second. A Baki is going to be the genitive form. What would we think the Nominative would be. Elements, <laughs> Okay. This is, it would be a bacchus. So, what is an abacus? Yeah. What does it look like? Uh, they're like and they like Yeah. Okay. So, it, it's, it's like a stand with, with little beads, essentially, and just move them over to, to count. Uh, that was the standard word for, for math uh, in Latin, uh, the, the abacus. Uh, so Fibonacci wrote his uh, Libra Bhakti, which popularized uh, all the different um, Arabic numerals and included the word, the number zero in there. What, what I usually end up reading uh, in my own research is end up looking somewhat sort of like this. So it's very close to um, the, our, our Arabic numerals. It's just this, this little dude here, like, that, that's, that's four. And the five is just like a four. And that was eight. Uh, this is Albert Major, the, um, the, the engraver, uh, an artist who is um, doing his version of one through zero. Um, what really popularized and made everyone switch from Roman numerals for their actual math to Arabic numerals was the invention of the print in, in the 15th century, or at least the popularization of the printing press at that time. Okay, so that was the, the background. I probably talked way too long already. But let's get to the actual Greek stuff here. So one thing that I like to do every time I learn a random language is just get the numbers one through ten. So so that's what we're gonna get with. Ready? Okay, here we go. This is not gonna be something that you're gonna we're gonna do for a little math one, but this is just so you know. Uh, for the number one, there are these three different forms. There's there's Hes, Mia, and Hen. Who, who, who's here? Who do I know? Sean, why, why, why are there three forms here? Three different genders? Three different genders, yes. So, Greek and Latin, uh, and uh, several other languages, descending from that, and many other ones throughout the world, uh, have gender to all their different nouns. And when an adjective describes it, an adjective like a number, it would have to um, agree with the noun that it's describing in gender. So if it's a masculine, uh, one, one masculine thing, and this has nothing to do with actual uh, biological gender, anything to that effect, it, it's simply grammatical gender. So uh, uh, just doing the standard Latin example, uh, my finger, my digitus, is masculine, my manus, my hand is feminine, my brachium, my arm, is neuter, or neither. So we have masculine, feminine, and neuter. I like to just learn it because it's going to show up in more stuff. How do we, I know none of y'all learned the word yet, except, except for, yes, I, uh, but, but how, would, how would we try to read this? I think it looks close enough to our English letters. Oh. No, close, close. Duo, yes, good. It is duo. That's that one. Who wants to try the next one? This is a this is a tricky one, and it's going to come up when I give you guys the freak out that just did. Trace and tria. So this is this is this letter here that looks like a P. Totally not a P, right? Have we, have we looked at all the different sorority and fraternity houses around and, and 
and see that, I don't know if that one actually shows up, but the thing that looks like P in three is actually rho. So that's uh, tau rho epsilon you know, sigma. Uh, this one has a masculine slash feminine form and a neuter form. Tetrarays or tetra, before we get words of tetra. Uh, but but no, um, tetrarchies, things of that effect. Phi. Kenta, yeah, are these starting to look more familiar from geometry? Okay. What what would be six though? Hex. Yes, hex actually. So so this uh, there's a little tick up here that you can barely see. That's it's what's called a rough breathing part. So it's hex. Same thing with seven. Hepta, hepta is the Greek one. Septa we're going to get to. Uh, uh, hepta, eight. Octo, look at that cool dude. It looks like a W, that's an omega. Um, Henia. Oops, I skipped. Deca. Deca, right. And then we get Hendeca, Dodeca, or like dodecahedrons, and words like that. Uh, Hecaton, or a hecaton, uh, that, that's a hundred in Greek. Um, what was that? Zillion. Close, yeah. Chilion, uh, that's going to be our pi. So, chilion, so that's going to be where we get all our different um, prefixes for the SI system. What would be a thousand in, in scientific terminology? Kilo. Kilo, yeah. So, so we, we, instead of doing a, a chi, we use the like, a K. How about a hundred? What does that look like as our prefix? Hecta. Hecta, yeah, very nice. Um, or or is also like hectare. And muriel is not one that we normally think about. This is where we get the word myriad. Uh, there are a myriad reasons to do this, but Morioi, it just uh, it means 10,000. The reason why we use myriad is just this insanely large number, uh, is what uh, it just was confused that way in Greek. Uh, what's the biggest number you can think of? They don't just shout out infinity. That was not that concept. We just say 10,000. It's the biggest number there is. We're going to go ahead and learn right quick. This is the count. The Greek alphabet. So, it's all up there. What I'd like you guys to do, for, for those that, that have walked by all the different um, sorority and fraternity houses, those are the capital ones, those are the ones you see. Go ahead and just, just name them as I write them. See if we can get some. Oh. Alpha. Beta. Beta. Very nice. Gamma. 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 Yeah. What is this guy? Yeah, Very nice. And you guys have that, right? Ooh. Epsilon. Epsilon. Good job. This thing, which is, which is a big one. This is not one we're going to see because it, 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 it's a replacement. This is what's called a die gamma. So, so it's, it's a one gamma plus another gamma stuck in there. Um, this was phased out very early in Greek. Uh, we do have remnants of it in uh, Homer. We, we can see that even though it's not written in there, that the meter just doesn't match up. So we know that some people's names originally had what kind of has a W sound in front of it. So the word for uh, king usually is written in Monox, but it was, it was known as Wanox. And uh, there's two very famous dudes named Achilles and Odysseus, and both their names we can know from this were actually Wakaleus and Wodysseus. Mm -hmm. So again, we can get that piece out. It's called Die Gamma. All right. What is this? Zeta. Good job. What, what is our, our H thing? I heard, I, heard, I heard that. Ada? Ada. Bottom. Theta. Theta. And so these are going to be our numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Because we don't have zero yet. So this is going to be all the ones place. Um, all right, let's 
see if we can just go through that. What's that guy? Iota. Iota? What's that? Kappa. Kappa. Very nice. What's wavelength? Good job. Yeah. I heard new. I heard new. There's this thing. C or psi. Oh, what's O? Oh, not quite omega. This is O micron. This is this is this is little O. Our favorite one. Hi. And then there's there's this thing over here, which is either the 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 a Bowie symbol or the gender neutral symbol. Uh, it is comma or kappa. Right, this is another lost letter. What's this guy? Rho. Rho. Sigma. Sigma. So it's actually two forms. Tau. Tau. Very good. Upsilon. Upsilon. Phi. Phi. Or phi, depending on how I want to do that one. Chi. Right? Our kiloid. Kiloid. What's up? Psi. Psi. Omega. Which looks like a, a little bug down there. And finally, yeah, San or Sampi. Uh, that's a, it's a, it's a weird loss. So, this is going to be 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, 800, and 900. In basically the 3rd century BC to about the 5th century AD, they only used uppercase letters for writing in Greek. So they would only use the uppercase when they were um, writing numbers as well, to distinguish the numbers from words. Uh, because it would be very confusing when letters are also the same thing as numbers. They would write a little line up. So we have, there we go. Omega lambda zeta would be 837. If we need something bigger, we would use what's called a myriad notation. So we'd use the M meaning myriad, and above it, we would put uh, anything that would go into the 10,000th place above. So psi, nu, epsilon, data, rho, pi, beta. Let's go, I'm going to skip ahead to the end. Here we go. No. There. This one has been taken from PSAT questionnaire through the practice exam. I'm going to go ahead and give you guys your time. In a certain game, a player can solve easy or hard puzzles. A player earned lambda points for solving an easy puzzle and psi points for solving a hard puzzle. Tina solved a total of new puzzles uh, playing this game and earned alpha, sam, nu, point in all. How many hard puzzles did Tina solve? Man, go for it. Right, so, so the, that, the, what do we think? Um, what we're going to do is get the, the, the transcribe of it. A player earns lambda points. So, how many points do they get for an easy puzzle? 30 points. Very good. How many points for a hard puzzle? Very good. There we go. How many puzzles did Tina play?
So the answer is C. Close. B. B. So B is what number is that? Fifteen. Now, how do we do that? Does it work if we do the X and Ys? I love X and Ys. Okay. How do we do X and Ys? Thirty X plus sixty Y equals nineteen fifty. Very nice. And substitute one. We should get that, I think. That should give you the well, that would give me, substitute y because what about y, right? Mm -hmm. Does that work? I, I just cheated and checked the answer here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Great job, guys. So hopefully <laughs> that's gonna help you a bit on your, your PSAT tomorrow. Uh, if you are interested in learning more about the food sort where English comes from. I do recommend you take studies in the English language. If you are interested uh, in the history of various language groups, um, learning about where zero comes from, things like that, uh, I recommend taking our Arabic or also the Sanskrit special studies class. Uh, if you are interested in uh, learning um, more about Greek in general, uh, go ahead and either take our uh, ancient medieval course for the introduction to ancient Greek. All right, that, that's my plug. Awesome. <laughs> it was great seeing you guys. Have a good night. As someone who has a background in English, it's interesting to see how our language has evolved over time. Like the words one, two, ten. You know, that's called etymology. And it's just really interesting to know how these words came into existence and how we use them today and how those words can cross different languages. I appreciate Dr. Tishner so much for sharing his passion for these dead languages with you and our current students. But we're going to end today with a lecture from one of our most popular classes and one of our most popular professors, Dr. Kyle Stevens. Now, Dr. Stevens is a, has a wealth of trivial information that he'll share with anybody. But when you see him next, ask him, how did McDonald's come into play? But today you're going to see a lecture from Dr. Stevens' most popular class and one that's very hard to get into, the age of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. But what's interesting about this particular presentation, and there's really no other way to preview this lecture, then to prepare you to hear about the bromance that played a crucial role in our 20th century history. So I welcome Dr. Stevens. Hey y'all, good evening. I'm so glad to see you. If you will permit me, I'm going to remove my mask just while I talk to you for a few minutes here. Uh, you don't want me hyperventilating. I want to make sure that you can understand me. I mutter in normal times. It's so glad, I'm so glad to see you back on campus. I mean, not Morgan and not Liliana, but I'm so happy to see the rest of you back on campus. It does, it does my heart good. As I was thinking about what I wanted to talk to you tonight, I thought I would choose one of my favorite lectures from my favorite class that I teach. It's the age of FDR. And let's just jump in if I can figure out how these things work. Can you guys hear me okay? Just pull the Okay. The big three, Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin in the middle of World War I. What could be better? Now, the 32nd American president, Franklin Roosevelt, only met the British Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, in August of 1941. August of 1941. England had already been at war for 23 months in September 1939. What we have here is a wartime leader. And what we have here is 
a peacetime president. They met at a place called Argentia Bay. It's off the coast of Newfoundland, off Canada. It's very pretty, very picturesque, very foggy. And they met on the deck of a mighty British battleship called HMS Prince of Wales. And both men, who were not accustomed to being nervous, were nervous. FDR wanted Churchill, this lion of British history during the last 40 years, to like it. And Churchill really wanted FDR to like him because Churchill really wanted the United States to come into the war. The whole ride over, the whole ride, the whole sail over on the Atlantic aboard this ship, Churchill kept changing and rechanging his outfits. He wanted his costume to be just right. And again, he was nervous. He knew that President Roosevelt was head of state, whereas he was just a minister. The king, King George VI, was head of state. But they got along all right. In fact, they got along famously. But again, it was awkward. Great Britain is at war. America is at peace. Five months later, the situation had totally changed. On December 7, 1941, the Japanese bombed the U.S. Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, and Franklin Roosevelt invited Winston Churchill, Prime Minister Churchill, to the White House. What they're doing right now is they're lighting their, the ceremonial Christmas tree out on the lawn. The President spoke to the people, the Prime Minister spoke to the people, and if you can look closely, you can see one of the most awkward accidental photo bombs in American history. Churchill was great that night. He went up and in that wonderful, melodious, slightly lisping voice that I'm not even gonna pretend to imitate, he said, let the children have their play. Tomorrow we will get to work to win the war. And they got along absolutely famously. They were both the sons of rich families. Franklin Roosevelt, of course, came from a famous political family. His own fifth cousin, Teddy Roosevelt, had been the 26th president of the United States. Churchill came from royalty, for real royalty. His ancestor had been the Duke of Wellington who helped defeat Napoleon in 1815. They absolutely adored each other's company. They got along, they laughed, they drank, they planned the war, they drank, they talked about their past and books they were reading, they drank, they absolutely adored each other's company. And when the press corps was invited in, you could feel the amiability between these two men. You could see that they were absolutely comfortable with each other. Churchill, of course, has his big thick cigar. FDR is chain smoking his cigarettes. You'll notice on his left armband, FDR is wearing a black band of mourning. A few months earlier, in September 1941, his mother, Sarah Delano Roosevelt, had died, and FDR was still feeling the grief. But he was chipper, he was cheery, and you could just see that these two titans of the age were comfortable in each other's presence. Why does that matter? It's not because everyone loves the story of a good bromance, although we do. It's because these two men are gonna have to come together to plot a strategy to destroy Hitlerism, to destroy the Third Reich and Imperial Japan. The reporters marveled at how they just seemed to get along. They would almost, but not quite, finish each other's sentences. But the big moment of this three-week visit in December 1941 came the day after Christmas when the Prime Minister of Great Britain delivered a speech before a joint session of Congress. Churchill, who again didn't get all that nervous all that often, this is someone who learned to fly at the age of 40 and crashed more airplanes than I have fingers. He was feeling it at this moment. Now, you'll notice this doesn't quite look like the House Chamber, those of you who are interested in political history, and it wasn't the House Chamber, it was the Senate Chamber. You've got Vice President Henry A. Wallace up here on the right, Winston Churchill here in front of all the cameras. It's December 26, 1941. Most of Congress, despite the bombing of Pearl Harbor, had gone home for the holidays. And it would be a tremendous humiliation for President Roosevelt if the Prime Minister of Great Britain spoke before a joint session of Congress and there were empty seats. 
So very cleverly, very quietly, they put the Prime Minister in the Senate chamber. Instead of 435 seats to fill, there are only 96. The place was packed, and that more intimate setting of the Senate chamber made it kind of more, more fun, it made it more intimate, it made it easier to laugh. And this is what Churchill said in part. The fact that my American forebears have for so many generations played their part in the life of the United States, and that here I am, an Englishman, welcomed in your midst, makes this experience one of the most moving and thrilling in my life, which is already long and has not been entirely uneventful. To say that his life had not been entirely uneventful is the understatement of the 20th century. When he was a young man, a young cavalry officer in Africa, he saw some of the bloodiest conflicts of British colonialism. He was captured by the Dutch in South Africa during the Boer War at the turn of the 20th century. He had served as head of the Admiralty in England during World War I for a time, served as a lieutenant colonel in charge of one of the great regiments, the Royal Scots Fusiliers, the one of the great regiments in British military history. On the front lines, in the trenches during World War I, never got a scratch. But this is the most thrilling moment, he says, of his life. And he says, I wish indeed that my mother, who was an American, whose memory I cherish across the veil of years, could be here to see. By the way, I cannot help reflecting that if my father had been American and my mother British, instead of the other way around, I might have got here, that is, before Congress, on my own. Slightly hinting that if his parents had been reversed, he might be President of the United States, and they just loved it. He was charming, he was friendly, he was a great writer, and when it was over, he flashed his famous V for Victory sign. Perhaps a childish gesture, but it was what the American Congress and the American people needed just three weeks after the shock of Pearl Harbor. Later, writing his memoirs, Churchill wrote, it was with heart stirrings that I fulfilled the invitation to address the Congress of the United States. The occasion was important for what I was sure was the all-conquering alliance of the English-speaking peoples. He adored that phrase, the English-speaking peoples. Churchill loved the United States. He loved American history. He knew all about Lincoln. He had read all about the American Civil War. The English-speaking peoples. For two years, for two and a third years, Winston Churchill had been holding on, waiting, waiting, praying. What was Churchill's war strategy? To hold out until the Americans could get in. He was positively giddy. Yet to me, said Churchill, who could trace unbroken male descent on my mother's side through five generations from a lieutenant who served in George Washington's army, it was possible to feel a blood right to speak to the representatives of the great republic and our common cause. Another phrase that he used again and again. Whenever American reporters, American journalists would say, Mr. Churchill, Mr. Churchill, what's our goal? He would mention the common cause. Letting the American people know, not too subtly, we're all in this together. And what a grand time they had for three weeks. You can see the intimacy. You can see the camaraderie here. You can't, this is not something you can fake. Churchill, is not entirely sober. <laughs> Roosevelt is at a rare moment of ease, at a rare moment of being comfortable with other people. Franklin Roosevelt is, is a wonderful personality and an incredibly complicated personality. He never let you see what was inside. He couldn't let you see what was inside. He was psychically conditioned from a very early age to have a mask on. I might as well tell you the story real quick. His father died, his father was much older than his mother, and his father died when he was young. And that trauma, that experience of losing his father when he was just 18, made him always want to make sure everyone in the room was happy. He wanted to make sure you were comfortable. He wanted to make sure you, well not you, but he wanted to make sure everyone <laughs> in the room was comfortable, was happy. And so he had a mask on all the time. Google any image you want of FDR. 
And you'll see that his face is alive, it's animated, he's expressing interest, amusement, happiness. You rarely see his face relaxed, but you see it around Winston Churchill. By the way, the man had an enormous head. His head was absolutely gigantic. This is King George VI of England, and this is President Roosevelt. The mole over his eyebrow is almost the size of the king's eye. He had this massive head, did FDR, and he also had a massive body. His upper body strength was absolutely formidable. He'd been a great athlete back in the day before he caught, excuse me, before he caught <laughs> polio in the summer of 1921. They are not entirely sober. <laughs> And here's the thing, Ben Franklin once famously said, fish and guests stink after three days. Prime Minister Churchill did not wear out his welcome quite that quick. He was so charming and he was so likable and he was so alive. You've never seen anyone more in love with being Winston Churchill than Winston Churchill. So he didn't wear out his welcome after three days, but like 11 days? The man never woke up before 11 a.m. in his life if he could help it. For 75 years, he always had alcohol in his bloodstream. He was a great manic force. And Franklin Roosevelt, who was eight years younger, just cannot keep up. I mean, he looks like he is about to collapse. What are they there to do? They're there to talk about the war. When do we invade France? How do we do it? When do we invade France? How do we do it? 1942, it's never going to happen. We don't have the planes, the ships, the men. 1943, can we invade France? Can we liberate France in 1943? That's tough. 1944, maybe. What's the goal? To liberate France, not just because of the French, but to take pressure off the Russians in the east, on the eastern front. How do we keep the Russians engaged in the war, killing Germans long enough for us to get a foothold in Europe? They don't know. All the stuff we know now, they didn't know back then. But what FDR did know is that he is exhausted. Harry Hopkins, Franklin Roosevelt's number one aide, his number one lieutenant, during the war, the closest thing Franklin Roosevelt had to a best friend, but not a best friend, Harry Hopkins said this, the Prime Minister's sleeping arrangements have now become quite promiscuous. He talks with the President until 2 a.m. and consequently spends a large part of the day hurling himself in and out of bed, bathing at unsuitable moments, and rushing up and down corridors in his dressing gown. Speaking of dressing gown, one time, FDR, in his wheelchair, wheeled himself in to the Prime Minister's room in the White House, on the second floor of the White House. And FDR didn't know that Churchill liked to think in the tub. He liked to think in the tub. He took nine baths a day. For 90 years, he took baths, but he never once learned to draw the bath water himself. But he loved bathing. He would sit in the tub and he would write, or sometimes he would dictate letters or dictate speeches. He just liked to be in the water. And once in the middle of the afternoon, when you wouldn't expect to see a grown man in a tub, FDR wheels himself in. Churchill is in a bathroom, still hot and pink from his bath. And they start talking. FDR is like, I'm sorry, I didn't know you were in the tub. This is awkward. Let me back up. Churchill takes a step to the side, and he accidentally stepped on, you know, the little cord that ties the bathrobe? He accidentally stepped on the cord, and the whole silk bathrobe just slid from his shoulders, just like that. And there stood Churchill in all of his pink glory. FDR wanted to die. <laughs> and Churchill, cool as a cucumber, said, <clears throat> as you can see, Mr. President, the Prime Minister of Great Britain has nothing to hide from the President of the United States. <laughs> and he totally salvaged the situation. <laughs> that said, 
FDR is losing it. He wants this man to go home. He says to the labor secretary, Frances Perkins, the first female cabinet member in American history, by the way, he says, I'm nearly dead. I have to talk to the prime minister all night, and he gets bright ideas in the middle of the night and comes pattering down the hall to my bedroom in his bare feet. They are probably good ideas, but I have to have my sleep. That's at Christmas time, 1941. Thirteen months later, fourteen months later, in early 1943, the two wartime leaders meet at Casablanca in Morocco, in unoccupied French Morocco, to hammer out the final strategy of the war. And everyone knows what that strategy is going to be. Two words, unconditional surrender. By the way, do you want to see the most adorable photograph of your life? If you think that's not precious, you are not human. <laughs> they instantly rekindled that old affection between them, hanging out. When reporters would ask them questions, FDR would whisper in the church of ear, what are they talking about? We don't know. We just know that we're not in the inner circle, and they are. How cool are they? And while the conference in Casablanca was going on, Churchill had been eyeing a 60-foot-high tower that was outside their villa where they were staying. And the whole time during the 10 days of the conference, or however long it was, Churchill kept saying, I wish we could get Roosevelt up there. I wish he could see the view from up there. And Churchill, behind Roosevelt's back, got two Secret Service agents to agree to carry the president in the fireman carry up 60 steps to the top of this tower because Churchill wanted Roosevelt to see the view. And this is one of my favorite photographs of the 20th century. As I said, FDR's face was always illuminated. He could be crying tears, but if you came across him, he would put on a happy face. It was just the way he was wired. But his face is relaxed. He doesn't look cool, he doesn't look dignified, but he looks authentic. And then look at Churchill. What's that look on Churchill's face as he stares at his friend, the American president? Two questions. What in the world is Roosevelt staring at that's got him mesmerized? And what's that look on Churchill's face? I'll come back to that. When FDR left, he was the first president to fly while in office. The first president to fly after he left office was the 26th president, FDR's fifth cousin, Franklin Roosevelt. But FDR was the first president to fly while president. Churchill said, come, let us go home. I don't like to see them take off. It makes me far too nervous. If anything happened to that man, I couldn't stand it. He is the truest friend. He has the farthest vision. He is the greatest man I've ever known. Churchill was one for all his many flaws, was one of the most eclectic and brilliant people who had ever lived, but Churchill had a very rough eight years between 1932, when he was basically expelled from politics, he was ostracized from the British cabinet, until 1940 when he came in as the prime minister after the Nazis invaded France and Belgium and Holland, during those eight years, between 1932 and 1940, Churchill found solace in painting. Churchill was one of those hyperactive, manic, memorable individuals who suffered from a deep, deep depression. Sometimes people are like this in human history. Abraham Lincoln suffered from melancholy, although not as bad as Churchill. Teddy Roosevelt suffered from a deep depression which is why he was always so active. Churchill called his depression the Black Dog. And whenever he wrote it, he would capitalize the beat, capitalize the, the Black Dog is coming. I can feel the Black Dog on my heels. And one day in 1915, when he was still a young man of just 41, yes, 41 is still young, when he was fired from his job as first Lord of the Admiralty, Churchill was in the blackest, darkest depression of his life. The man who had to be in the, the arena 
had lost his career, he thought, for good. This is in 1915. And he was sulking in the garden one day. And he saw his sister-in-law painting with watercolors. He knew he wanted something to occupy his time. He needed to keep the depression at bay. He tried stamp collecting, hated it. Tried golf, absolutely hated it. Called the game of golf chasing a quinine pill around a cow pasture. A quinine pill is what they gave you for malaria back in the day, so you know what he thought of that. And Churchill took up his sister-in-law's watercolors and found he liked it. So he sent his wife to the store. He's not going to use puny watercolors. Oil on canvas, nothing but the best for this guy. And he started to paint. Painted hundreds of pictures in his life, maybe thousands. Hundreds of pictures in his life. But only one during World War II. Only one painting between 1939 and 1945. What's FDR looking at? Moroccan mountains covered in snow, 12,000 feet high. What's the look on Churchill's face? It's love. This is what he painted for his friend, Franklin Roosevelt. He's pretty good, right? The intimacy in Washington in December 1941, the intimacy at Casablanca in January 1943, but there's a problem, and it's in Moscow. FDR knows that Russians are killing nine out of 10 German soldiers. It is absolutely imperative to keep the monstrous dictator, Joseph Stalin, happy. Russia got out of World War I. Russia made a separate peace in 1917. That cannot be allowed to happen again. FDR has to keep the Russians in the war indefinitely. Stalin might be a worse mass murderer than Hitler, as awkward as that sounds, but he was our mass murderer. And FDR had to be a cold-hearted politician looking at the big picture. Who's this scrawny-looking chap here? That's Harry Hopkins, the Commerce Secretary, who was the closest thing FDR had to a best friend. Stalin did not like anybody, and he did not trust Americans. But he got along with the sickly, cadaverous, chain-smoking Hopkins. Both Hopkins and Stalin were great smokers. Maybe that's why they got along. But Harry Hopkins reported back to Roosevelt, it is absolutely critical that we settle on a date for the invasion of France to keep the Soviets in the war. Why? I'm not even going to read all of these to you. But I'll read a few. 1,700 cities and towns destroyed, 7,000 villages, 6 million buildings, 31,000 factories, 1,100 coal mines, 3,000 oil wells, 40,000 miles of railroad track, 56,000 miles of roads, countless farms, trucks, tractors, millions and millions of head of livestock, and a minimum of 20 million human beings. It's easy for Americans to forget that we lost 400,000 people in World War II. The Soviets lost a minimum of 20 million. It might have been 25 million. Hopkins knew that. FDR knew that. And when all three of them finally got together in December 1943 at Tehran in Persia, in Iran, somehow FDR had to make the transition from being Churchill's best friend to being Stalin's closest ally. Winston Churchill, born 1874. In 1943, he turned 69 years old during the Tehran Conference. All Churchill wanted was for his friend Roosevelt to stay with him, Churchill, at the British Embassy in Tehran and celebrate his birthday together. Franklin Roosevelt instead chose to stay with Joseph Stalin at the Soviet Embassy. because the Russians were far more important at this point in the war than the British. FDR is literally leaning towards Stalin, perhaps subliminally saying, 
we're allies, we're comrades, we're together. Happy Churchill, sad Churchill. And to learn the rest of the story, I guess you're going to have to take my FDR class next fall. See you guys. So you learned about the bromance. And that's just one thing you'll learn from a faculty member like Dr. Stevens. And there's so many of them here at the Louisiana School who can offer you pieces of information that when you pull them together, it makes you really appreciate what happened in the United States and what has formed us to what we are today. So again, Dr. Stevens, I really appreciate the time you spent with us today. Now, I want to especially thank Mr. Mike Sumner from Enrollment Services, and all of you know Mike because he's the one that's been working with you all over this past semester, sharing his experiences about the Louisiana School, both as an Enrollment Services professional, but also as a graduate of the school himself. But Mike is the one who spearheaded this project. He is the one who created the question and answer session, or panel if you want to call it today, that included some of our very tired students who just had gone through a four-hour test. But Mike also put together this four-and-a-half-hour presentation that you've watched today. So I promise you that you gave four-and-a-half hours to a great experience, and I promise you that you did not miss a good nap. It was worth watching Mike, Dr. Stevens, Dr. Langford, all of our professors share their passion for this Louisiana school experience. Now, we're leaving you after four and a half hours of a lot of information very fast. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to take all of this and absorb it in one sitting. It's virtual. You can watch this over and over again. But as you're watching it, and if there's things that make you wonder, and you're just like, hmm, is this something I want to learn more about? Jot it down. Call our admissions office. Ask to speak to one of our admissions counselors, and we'll get you that answer. And if that involves rounding up a faculty member in one of our disciplines to give you more information about course offerings that the Louisiana School will be providing over the next year, we'll take care of that too. Moms and dads, if you're still concerned about this experience and you want to talk to us more about living arrangements, you want to talk to us more about food, give us a call in the admissions office. We have got great things going on at the Louisiana School, and next year it'll even be better when you look behind the school and you see that huge building that we're calling our Living and Learning Commons area, your students will have a chance to share in that experience because they'll be the first group to live in the residence hall. Thank you all for participating in our Exploration Day. As soon as it is possible to get you back on this campus, we're going to do it. We miss you all as much as you miss us. The experiences here as a state residential school cannot be compared to any other school. We're doing our best to keep you safe, to keep you well, and to keep us well. And when we get back here as a family, I can assure you that we will be safe and we will be well and you will have one of the best educational experiences that you could have ever dreamed of having at the Louisiana School for Math, Science, and the Arts. Have a great evening.